started. Uh, today is Wednesday, November 24th, day before Turkey Day. And uh, like I said, I know we have a lot to cover. We finished uh, the brain anatomy, but we still have to talk about the protections of the brain. And then once we get that to finish off the central nervous system, we still have to talk about the spinal cord. So that'll be our goal in lecture today. And hopefully that won't take too, too much time because our big goal for today is to get through the cranial nerves, make sure we get an opportunity to talk about and discuss those uh, because it's going to be, uh, like I said, a big portion of our exam, both lab and lecture. Uh, we have a couple more assignments due on Monday. So again, you don't have to have, you get to have a tremendous amount of fun. You can go do your uh, Thanksgiving stuff tomorrow. You can do your Black Friday stuff on uh, on, uh, on Friday, and then uh, find some time this weekend to do your physio X. Again, there's nine activities. So as you know, it's not hard, but it will take a bit of time. So make sure you do all of that. Also next week, your 15 point nervous review. Uh, maybe you started working on that, but we will definitely uh, finish the rest of the information uh, in this first hour or so when we talk about the spinal cord, uh, you'll have all the information that you need to help yourself to be successful in completing that. And one of the things that the comments I always get by email, uh, usually at 11 o'clock the day before it's due, uh, is um, that there appears to be some redundant answers. And yeah, that's the point. Uh, the point is to emphasize this relationship between structure, function, and location. So I may give you the structure that's going to, and then you give me the function, but then I'll give you the location and you give me the function. So yes, there's going to be some uh, repetitive answers on this. That's kind of the point. I want to really emphasize that relationship between structure, function, and location. Uh, so we'll be doing that and that's due. And again, that will be graded for correctness. Monday the 6th, your last unit review, 14 is due. You also have a reflex lab, so it's not due till Monday the 6th, but uh, like I said, while you're not going to be able to necessarily do all the activities, you probably don't have a tuning fork at home, uh, you can do a lot of the other activities. And since you're likely getting together with family this weekend, it might be something you might want to pull out and uh, play with your loved ones on uh, this Thanksgiving weekend. So even though it's not due till the 6th, uh, you might want to take a look at that. It might be something that might be entertaining. If you get tired of playing cranium or something along those lines, uh, then you can mess around with those, hit each other with hammers. Uh, blind each other with lights, fun things like that. And then that's it. Then it's all exams after that. Uh, Wednesday the 8th, we have our lab and lecture exams. And then Wednesday the 15th, one week later, you have your 100 point cumulative final exam. 100 multiple choice questions, 100 points, everything we've covered in this class. All right. Questions on any of that? Excellent. My microphone is on this morning, right? You're not just seeing my lips move. You're hearing my voice. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. I assume everybody's probably just in the kitchen working and has this on in the background. Maybe that's what's going on. All right. Let's go ahead and get started then. As I mentioned uh, in the last class, we finished off talking about all of the structures, all of the cortical areas or the uh, ganglia or nuclei, I should say, and all of their functions in the last one. But as I also mentioned, we need to still talk about the things that protect it. And there are basically two things. There are the fluid filled spaces, which we mentioned, but I wanna really emphasize and go together. But the other thing that I wanna talk about that provides the protection is a structure known, or structures, I should say plural, known as the meninges. A meninges is the plural of the not one, not two, but three layers of protection uh, that help to provide protection for both our brain and our spinal cord. Uh, if you think about in the ventral body cavity, we've talked about the serous membranes like the peritoneum, like the pericardium, like the pleura that provide protection. Uh, we've talked about all of those things. Well, in the ventral, or, or dorsal body cavity, posterior, pardon me, uh, or, or ventral, pardon me, try that again, dorsal or posterior body cavity, uh, the brain and spinal cord are protected by a collection of connective tissues known as the meninges. Again, meninges is the plural, there are three of them, and each individual one, the singular would be the menix. The first menix, the largest menix, is what is known as the dura mater, right, the tough mother. 
notice, let's take a little look at the anatomy here. We have this right here. What does this structure right here represent? It's the skull. The yeah, bone. exactly. It's bone. Absolutely. And as we know, bone has a dense irregular connective tissue that wraps around its outer surface. And what would we call that dense irregular connective tissue based on its location? Periosteum. Exactly. This would be our periosteum. Well, if you notice, the periosteum on the inside of the skull is one of the two layers of the dura mater. We have that internal periosteum and then a second layer of dense irregular connective tissue. And actually, let's do it this way. So our dura mater is this very incredibly thick uh, fibrous tissue. Uh, this needs to be cut through if you're ever going to have some type of brain surgery done. And it's thick and leathery. It actually can be sewn back together after the surgery takes place. And notice here in the skull, the advantage of having one of those two layers be the periosteum is it keeps this big fibrous leather bag attached to the skull helping to anchor it and keep it in place, which helps to stabilize and anchor the brain in place. So we have these two big thick layers. Now notice something else happens as well. In some locations, that second layer separates from the first layer. Notice a great example of where this occurs is there is an extension of the dura mater that goes down in between the hemispheres in the longitudinal fissure. When that occurs, as you can see here, there becomes a space that forms in between those two layers of the dura mater. And this space is what is known as a dural sinus. Not sure if we've used the term sinus in this way in this class. When we talked about, for instance, the air-filled spaces of the nasal uh, cavity, we talked about those as being sinuses. But in this case, this sinus is a name for a very loose vein. There are several of these sinuses in the cranial cavity. And of course, what does a vein do? Transports carries blood to the heart. Yeah, carries blood back to the heart. Why might it be important to have these large, loose veins in the cranial cavity? For swelling purposes? Exactly. Absolutely. We want to make sure we drain that area because if, for instance, I slam my hand in the car door, right, on the way to Thanksgiving, uh, because I can't wait to see my mother-in-law, right? And I get that swelling, that accumulation of fluid in that space that's not able to drain as successfully, right? I may get a little tightness in the joints, right? I have a little bit of pain from that swelling. Am I going to die from the swelling of my hand? No. Probably not. But that's because I have space to expand. What about here in your cranial region? Is it okay to have swelling inside of your skull? No, it's much, much more dangerous. So we want to try to make it as easy as possible to get the blood out of the cranial cavity so we don't get that edema, so we don't get that swelling. And so as a result of that, we have these big dural sinuses uh, that can help to uh, drain both the cerebral spinal fluid, but also the blood and get it out of the cranial cavity as easily as possible. So that's the other advantage of having two layers. In some areas, those two layers can separate, and that's where this big, loose blood vessel is going to be found. And we see an example of that right here. All right. Questions on that? All right. Our second layer, shown here in purple, as you can see, is a nice thin layer. But what is distinct about this one is it has a large number 
of fibers that come off of it. It kind of gives it a cobwebby type of appearance, whereas where, which is where it gets its name, arachnoid matter, because of course arachnoid refers to what? Spider. Spiders, absolutely, because so it has this kind of cobwebby, spiderwebby type of appearance to it. And the advantage of this fibrous webby space is there is a massive space within here, what is known as the subarachnoid space. This subarachnoid space is where our cerebral spinal fluid bathes the outer surface of the brain. Again, this is like you being protected inside of the bathtub. If you were inside of the bathtub and we shook the bathtub around, you would bounce off the walls of the bathtub and that wouldn't be particularly fun. But if we filled the bathtub with water first and then shook it around, would you bounce against the walls of the uh, bathtub as easily as I bounced you around? No, Probably. because that water would help to cushion you. Right, and so uh, that's what happens here. Having this layer of fluid around the outer surface of the brain provides this cushion and support to help to provide that additional protection as we move our head and jump and swim and bounce and skip and do all those kind of uh, physical activities. Our brain doesn't rattle around and bounce against the walls of our skull. There is a third layer, as you can see here, in blue, what is known as the pia matter. The pia matter is basically like a shrink wrap that basically goes into the nooks and crannies, into the sulci, holding the gyri to get up together. It helps to stabilize the blood vessels and it basically anchors everything in place. Remember, as I mentioned, the brain uh, has the consistency of pretty much jello. And does Jello hold its shape really, really well? No. No, absolutely not. So by having this shrink wrap around it, it again helps to stabilize it and hold the blood vessels in place and anchor the tissue in place as well. So we have these three layers, the dura matter, the arachnoid matter, and the pia matter. And we also have two spaces. Let's do this again, only this time on the whiteboard. Here is the skull. Under the skull, we have our periosteum. which is one of the two layers. Actually, let's not use purple for this. If we use blue, I can use two different colors of blue. Our periosteum connected to and surrounding our bone. But then as we mentioned, we have a second additional layer. Those two layers of dense irregular connective tissue. And now that I've done this, let's make everything shorter. Which is our dura matter. All right, then as we mentioned, underneath that, we'll use purple for our arachnoid matter. Now, oh, and uh, just to remind ourselves, it has a lot of fibers, that forms that subarachnoid space.
And as we mentioned, the subarachnoid space contains cerebral spinal fluid. Oops. All right, we're comfortable with that so far? Yes. Now, I have two layers, the dura matter and the arachnoid matter. I have two hands, a left hand and a right hand. When I put my left hand and my right hand together, do they suddenly fuse and become one structure? No. 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 But is there anything between them? No. No. So notice between them is what we would call a potential space. There is the possibility to put something in there if we could, if we needed to, but with them slapped up against each other, there's really nothing there and it's a potential space. We actually have the same thing here. Here, between the dura matter and the arachnoid matter, we have what is known as the subdural space. But this subdural space is really just a potential space here in the cranial cavity. If everything is good, healthy and normal, there should be nothing in that space. However, should you take a blow to the head, should some blood vessels burst, is it possible that some blood could swell in this space? Yes. Yeah, and what would we call such an event? Subdural hematoma. Exactly. When you were watching that ER show, or you know what, I guess ER hasn't been on in a billion years, but whatever the new, uh, or I guess Grey's Anatomy is still on for, uh, you know, and they talk about a subdural hematoma. This is what they're talking about. Blood filling this space, this potential space where it's, uh, there's nothing supposed to be in there, but blood accumulates in that potential space, filling up that, putting pressure on the brain, and that can cause a problem. Right. So typically, uh, you know, usually it's episode ends at a car accident and they're out in the middle of nowhere. And so they have to find some rusty old drill where they're able to then drill a hole into the space, releasing the blood, releasing the pressure so that the person doesn't die and everybody lives happily ever after. All right. Excellent. So we have one real space, the subarachnoid space that contains fluid. The subdural space is a real space too, but it's a potential space. There's actually nothing in it. Whereas the subarachnoid space contains cerebral spinal fluid, uh, the, um, dur the subdural space doesn't contain anything. Lastly, as I mentioned, we have that thin layer, that pia matter, which sits right on top of the gray matter of our nervous tissue and also will penetrate down into the sulci of the tissue as well. Now, there's one more structure I want to talk about. We're going to talk about the circulation of the cerebral spinal fluid in a moment. But uh, as we hinted at in the last class, the cerebral spinal fluid is fluid that is filtered out of the blood. So if it comes out of the blood, what do we need to do with it? Replace it? Yeah, put it back into the blood. If it comes out of the blood, we need to put it back into the blood. We want to circulate it. We don't want to just have the same cerebral spinal fluid in this space since you've been born. We want to be constantly making new cerebral spinal fluid to bathe these services. And then that means we need to put it back into the blood. The way this happens is there is a finger-like extension of the arachnoid matter that penetrates up into those dural sinuses that we talked about. And what's the name we've given to a finger-like extension before? Papillae. papillae, absolutely. We have an arachnoid papillae. That is going to uh, penetrate into the dural sinuses. 
and that will allow us to uh, return the cerebral spinal fluid back into the blood. I know my drawing here is very, very basic, but we've got some pretty pictures uh, here from the textbook that will show this nicely as well. So here is this picture. Notice like I've just drawn uh, before, we have our periosteum and the second uh, dense uh, irregular connective tissues forming the dural matter. And here in this case, we have the sinus in between. Here we have that potential space, that subdural space between the dura matter and the arachnoid matter. Here is our subarachnoid space that is filled with the cerebral spinal fluid, the pia matter sitting on top of the cortex. And I think, oh, we'll get to that in a second. Oh, all right, hold on, I got a cheat. Uh, where is it? Here we go. Come on. I want you to let me share the screen. There we go. Here we see an example of that arachnoid villi, that arachnoid papillae, or the other name they use for it is an arachnoid granulation. So any of those are acceptable. Villi, papillae, or uh, arachnoid granulation. All of those are terms that are used for this. But here we see it is that extension of the arachnoid matter into the dural sinus to drain the cerebral spinal fluid. One last picture I want to show you. Actually, two more pictures I want to show you. Here, we've talked it in the illustration, we've drawn it, but here we actually see it in real life. Right? Notice over here on the right, uh, we have the skull, we have the skin and the hair, and then here we have that big, thick, leathery dura matter. Again, it is very thick, it is very fibrous. And notice we can also, let's change colors, see these sinuses that are embedded within that dura. Notice over here on the left, the dura has been removed. Down here, you can see some of the fuzzy fibers that make up the arachnoid matter. It's very flimsy, it's not very easy to see. But notice as you look over here at the cerebral cortex, you can see that it is tightly held together and it has a shiny surface and you can see the blood vessels laid over the top of it. And that is because that shrink wrap of the uh, pia matter has been put on top of it. You may, I may not have emphasized it at the time, but let's take a look at one other thing. Uh, I have to go back and find it because I didn't bring it up, but here we go. Notice the difference here. Here, all the superficial blood vessels have been removed and all of the uh, sulci are loose and open. The gyri are kind of uh, moved away from each other. This is a brain where the pia matter has been removed. Again, not all the blood vessels have been removed. We can still see the deep blood vessels that are located in it, but the gyri are open. I mean, that sulci are open. We can see those spaces in between the gyri. Compare that to this tightly packed, shiny surface that still has that shrink wrapped pia matter on it. All right. Questions on those?
All right, excellent. So those are the meninges, the three layers of fibrous connective tissues that are gonna help to protect the brain. But as we've also talked about, oh, and oh, I lied. There's one more thing I have to say about that. Notice, remember, as I mentioned, there are the dural sinuses, which we can see. You're not gonna be responsible for the names of the individual ones on this exam. But when you get to the cardiovascular system in 431, you'll have to learn them. But as we mentioned, there are folds of that second layer that help to hold the brain in place. And in particular, there are three of them that you need to know the name of. We actually already talked about the first one. The first one was the one that penetrates deep down into the longitudinal fissure, helping to stabilize the two hemispheres. That extension of the dura matter is what is known as the Falx cerebri. Notice there is also an extension of the dura matter that goes between the two hemispheres of the cerebellum. However, if you remember, the cerebellum doesn't have a big invagination between the two hemispheres. Instead, it has that raised ridge, that vermis. So sitting on top of the vermis, notice it's much, much more shallow because it can't go deep into the cerebellum, but still on the midline helping to stabilize the two hemispheres is our Fox cerebelli. And lastly, and in fact, if we go back to the previous picture, notice there is some dura matter that sits between the cerebellum and I mean the cerebellum and the cerebrum. This bit of dura matter that sits between the two, like a tent over the top of the cerebellum, is the tentorium cerebelli. And so notice if we go to the illustration, we see the same thing. This tent-like extension of the dura matter that separates the cerebellum from the cerebrum is the tentorium cerebelli, like a tent over the top of the cerebellum, which is where it gets its name. So these are three extensions of the dura matter that you are responsible for identifying. And they stabilize the brain and hold it in place. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. So now that we've hit the fiber structures, the meninges, as we talked about before, but I want to emphasize again, there are these fluid filled spaces inside of the brain. We actually mentioned almost all of them when we were talking about the brain anatomy. Notice there are these two paired big C shape spaces, the largest spaces, and they're two side by side inside the hemispheres. And what are these two structures called? Lateral ventricles. Lateral ventricles. If you weren't sure, hopefully you could read it off the board. Absolutely. But here's something that's not on the board. Remember, there was a thin fibrous extension of tissue that sits between the corpus callosum and the fornix that helps to separate the two lateral ventricles. What was that structure called? Intermediate mass. We'll talk about the intermediate mass in a second. The intermediate mass, remember, was in the third ventricle. It wasn't between the two lateral ventricles. We had the corpus callosum, we had the fornix, and we have that dividing structure in between them. Did you not see the subtle pointing at the midline of my nose? Uh, septum. Um... Anyone help her out? Well, you got half of it. Septum pellucidum. 
the septum pellucidum. Absolutely. So we had that. That was the structure that we saw there. From there, we then identified the third ventricle that sits between the two uh, thalami. But notice there is a void in the center of our third ventricle, indicating that there must be a structure that connects the two, hemis uh, the two lobes of the thalamus together. And what was that structure that forms that void in the third ventricle? And now you can say it. That was the intermediate mass. That is the intermediate mass. Excellent. So we can actually see where the intermediate mass would be. Excellent. Now, notice these are fluid-filled spaces. We don't want these to be isolated islands. So any fluid that is made in a lateral ventricle needs to get to the third ventricle. And you'll notice there are these little passageways, spaces, these are all spaces, where fluid can get from the lateral ventricle to the third ventricle. Well, luckily we know the name of a tunnel-like structure, a foramen, and this foramen happens to be between two of the ventricles. So not surprisingly, it is the interventricular foramen. Now we have all this fluid in the third ventricle and we wanna get it to the fourth ventricle. Luckily, there's this water stealing passageway that goes from the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle. What did we call that water-filled passageway that goes through the midbrain from the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle? Well, again, if you're not sure, you could just read it off the board. Aqueduct of the membrane. There you go. Or remember, we also called it the cerebral aqueduct. Both of those would be expect acceptable and from there into the fourth ventricle, found in the space between the pons and the cerebellum. So these are structures, with the exception of the interventricular foramen, these are all things that we took note of when we were looking at the brain anatomy. Here, we see it from a anterior view. Again, we have these two big lateral ventricles that again has the septum pellucidum that separates them on the midline. Here we see the interventricular foramen that bring them to that centrally located third ventricle, our cerebral aqueduct that goes into our fourth ventricle. And notice our fourth ventricle is this kind of triangular space located here, again, between the pons and the cerebellum. Now, there's two things that I want to emphasize right here. First is that notice if you are a drop of cerebral spinal fluid hanging out here inside of the lateral ventricle, notice there is only one place you can go. The only place you can go is out the intervertebral, uh, interventricular foramen into the third ventricle. From the third ventricle, there's only one place you can go, through the cerebral aqueduct to the fourth ventricle. Once you're in the fourth ventricle, we'll see you have choices finally. There are actually four exits to the fourth ventricle, which is convenient because it's the fourth ventricle. And we'll talk about those in a second. But the other thing that I wanna talk about first is now we understand how cerebral spinal fluid will flow in these structures, but the question becomes, where does this cerebral spinal fluid come from? And the answer to that is something we actually talked about way back when we, at the very beginning of this, when we were talking about the cells of the nervous system. There is a structure called the choroid plexus. And basically, what this choroid plexus is, is a capillary 
Capillary is where exchange of materials take place. This is where our fluid and stuff will come out to make our cerebral spinal fluid. But do we want any old thing getting into this fluid and being able to affect our brain? Come on, these are the easy questions, folks. No, of course not. I don't know if that's an old no, Sarah, but I'll take it. Um, no, we want to regulate what's going to filter out of it. And so the way we do that is by having a special neural glial cell that is going to wrap around these capillaries and help to limit and regulate what becomes cerebral spinal fluid. And does anybody remember which of our neural glial cells in the central nervous system help us to make the cerebral spinal fluid? Epidermal cells. There you go. So this choroid plexus is this reddish capillary material that is found in all of the ventricles. It sits at the base of our lateral ventricles. It sits at the top of our third ventricle. And we actually saw it once before. Remember when we were looking at the pons from the back, we saw that fourth ventricle and we saw those two rows of choroid plexus in the fourth ventricle. So cerebral spinal fluid can be produced in any of these four regions. And let's take a look at this. Here, Notice we see that as well. Here they've got the choroid plexus kind of looking like chewing gum, lining the lateral sulcus, I mean the lateral ventricle there, the top of the third ventricle there, and here in our fourth ventricle. I think I've got another pretty picture. Uh, oh, here's a couple. Uh, here we see our uh, lateral ventricles. And this right here, is that choroid plexus they put on this side to show us where they'd make it here in the uh, lateral sulc uh, lateral ventricle. I think there's the one I wanted. And remember this picture when we were looking at the back of the uh, posterior view of the pons with the cerebellum missing, we see our fourth ventricle and that choroid plexus that is filling this space. So let's go back, go through some of these again. Again, notice cerebral spinal fluid can be made in any of these areas. So clearly if it's made right here in the fourth ventricle, then it's just gonna leave the fourth ventricle. But as we mentioned, if it's made here in the lateral ventricle, we'll start there because it's easy because then we can go through all of the structures. It has to pass through the interventricular uh, foramen into the third ventricle, down the cerebral aqueduct to the fourth ventricle. Obviously, if it's made here in the third ventricle, then it just goes down the cerebral aqueduct to the fourth. And as we said, if we made in the fourth, then it just stays there in the fourth. But the fourth is where we have options. We see some of these options here, but let's actually draw this first. We'll do this with some really simple schematics. Here are our two lateral ventricles. That works. All right, if you are a drop of cerebral spinal fluid, 
hanging out here in the lateral ventricle. How many ways can you leave the lateral ventricle? One way. One way. And what would we call that one way you could leave? Interventricular foramen. <clears throat> Excellent. And of course, there are two of them, one from each side. If you're in the third ventricle, how many ways are there to leave? There's one. one way. And what is it? Cerebral aqueduct of the midbrain. And it's perfectly acceptable to say it that way. You can also separate it. Cerebral aqueduct would be perfectly acceptable. Aqueduct of the midbrain would be uh, perfectly acceptable. Either of those are fine, or like you did, you can mash them together. That's fine as well. Excellent. There is only one way in to the fourth ventricle, but there are four ways out. As you saw before, it really does have a diamond shape, and that is because to the sides are our two lateral apertures. These lateral apertures feed cerebral spinal fluid uh, into the subarachnoid space. And they kind of do it um, at the level of the cerebrum, kind of a little bit at or a little above the cerebellum. We can also, and here, we'll do this as red. No, I don't want to use red, we'll do this as green. I'm gonna put, whoops, nope. I'm gonna put a dot right here near the bottom. Cause right on the midline, uh, going posteriorly, inferior and obviously medial of the lateral apertures is a median aperture. And this median aperture also feeds cerebral spinal fluid into the subarachnoid space. And it does it actually below the cere cerebellum. So, I know I've got it going off to the side, but it goes off the midline and I don't have a good way of drawing that. The last way out of the fourth ventricle is inferiorly. If you leave the fourth ventricle inferiorly, it goes down the center of the spinal cord. Remember, the spinal cord is still part of the central nervous system and needs to be protected as well. And we haven't done the anatomy of the spinal cord yet, but at the center of the spinal cord is a small fluid-filled tunnel or fluid-filled canal that is known as the central canal. So those are the four exits, and we can see them nicely from some of the illustrations we've been looking at. Notice if we come back to this one, here we can very nicely see two of these exits we were just talking about. Here on the midline, beneath the cerebellum is the median aperture, allowing that cerebral spinal fluid into the subarachnoid space uh, beneath the cerebellum. And here, we can see the central canal, which goes down the center of the spinal cord till ultimately it exits the spinal cord once again into the subarachnoid space. Notice they hint at the lateral aperture by showing kind of a dot to the side. Notice it is superior 
and to the side of the median aperture. But like I said, where I think we see this the best is actually here. Here, we can see where those openings would be to the side, and this would be where those lateral apertures would be. Notice from here, straight out beneath the cerebellum would be where the median aperture is. And if you notice, it kind of folds up to form a fluid filled tunnel that would go down the spinal cord and that would be the central canal. Lastly, the aqueduct of the midbrain would basically come out here. So this is our one entrance and our one, two, three, four, exits. Now, we know this choroid plexus is where we make the cerebral spinal fluid. It flows into it. And notice, no matter what path it takes, eventually it ends in the subarachnoid space. And remind me again how we get it out of the subarachnoid space. Color? Yeah, into the dural sinuses, absolutely. Out of the arachnoid granulations or villi or papillae into the dural sinuses. So we have those extensions of the arachnoid matter, the, like I said, arachnoid granulations, arachnoid papillae, arachnoid villi, all of those are acceptable names for it. So whatever tickles your fancy is where it is then put back into the blood supply. It came out of the blood supply in the choroid plexus and back into the blood supply at the arachnoid villi. All right. Questions on that? All right. With that, we're done with the brain. We've done the cere cerebrum, we've done the brainstem, we've done the protections, but we're not done with the central nervous system. Remember, the central nervous system includes the brain and the spinal cord. So that is what we are going to talk about next. I know it's a little bit early, but this is a good natural stopping point. So let's go ahead and take our first break here. Uh, we'll take a 15 minute break. That means uh, we will restart at uh, 9.13. And I will start the recording at that time. So any questions on what we've covered so far before we take our first break? All right, excellent. I will see you guys in 15 minutes then. All righty, onward and upward, or really downward in this case, into the spinal cord. Again, spinal cord is part of the central nervous system. This is important to remember. Too often we think of it as just being that highway and byway of getting information to and from the brain. And that is definitely one of its main functions carrying information towards the brain and down from the brain. But it also is part of the central nervous system. So it is involved in processing information. Uh, it has neurons in it whose job it is to do that bean counting we talked about, adding information together, excitatory and inhibitory inputs and making basic decisions. Now, again, your spinal cord isn't going to decide what you have for dinner or isn't going to decide what you want to be when you grow up, but it does make some important decisions. And typically those decisions made by the spinal cord, we call the reflexes. Like I said, you put your hand on something hot and you pull your hand away before you're even aware of the fact that you're in pain and should be cursing uh, because our spinal cord is able to integrate that information, process that information and make a very basic decision. Now we do have one other major issue. If you think about, let's grab a new page. 
grab our inf draw our infamous mitten at the top and then our spinal cord coming out from it. We have talked about information coming into and out of the spinal cord. And what did we call information or the direction for that information coming into the spinal cord? What type of information comes into the central nervous system? Isn't it ether? Uh, into the central nervous system, remember, was our afferent. And what type of information is afferent? Sensory. Sensory, excellent. So coming out of the central nervous system, uh, what direction did we call that? That's the efferent. That's the efferent. Excellent. And what type of information is efferent? Motor. Motor. Excellent. Notice we have a similar issue going on here in our spinal cord. There is information that needs to go up the spinal cord, and there is information that needs to go down the spinal cord. Based on what we've just drawn, what type of information do you think needs to go up the spinal cord? Sensory or motor? Sensory, exactly. However, can we still use the term afferent to describe the direction this information is going? Not really, because afferent means going into the central nervous system. And remember, the spinal cord is part of the central nervous system. So instead, the directional term we use for going up is ascending. And so then based on that, down the spinal cord, what kind of information would that be? Motor. And what do you think we would use for a directional term for that? Descending. Exactly. Exactly. So when we talk about those upward and downward traveling sensory and motor information, our sensory information is ascending, our motor information is going to be descending. Now, in my mind, when I think of the spinal cord, I always think about one of those big, huge transcontinental cables we talked about that used to be used for phone lines to get information from, uh, you know, from New York to uh, England or something like that. However, our spinal cord itself, when you actually look at it, pull it out of the body and look at it, it isn't actually that impressive. It's only about 16 to 18 inches long. And if you, again, we didn't get to hold, hopefully some of you actually went on campus and got to hold bones in your hand at the open lab. But if you ever held one of the vertebrae, I mean, you can barely get your thumb through the, that, um, that intervertebral foramen, not the intervertebral, the, the vertebral foramen in some of these vertebrae. So it's about the thickness of your thumb, maybe a little bit more than the thickness of your thumb, and only about 16 to 18 inches long. It's not very impressive. In fact, it stops growing in length at four years of age. Did you stop growing at length at four years of age? No. no probably not. So notice as our body continued to elongate, our spinal cord didn't. And so as you can actually see, the spinal cord doesn't actually go the entire length of the vertebral column, that vertebral cavity. In fact, it typically start, stops right about the L1, L2 region of your vertebral column. Now, you may not have thought of it in those terms, but some of you, especially if you've given birth, are aware of this because as you get wheeled into the hospital, uh, getting ready to give birth, what's the big question that everybody asks? Or an epidural. Are you gonna get an epidural? Absolutely. That epidural helps to deaden the pain uh, by basically numbing the lower half of your body. Uh, and if you decide to get the epidural, where do they typically give it to you? Epidural, is it epidural space? 
true, the goal is to get it into the epidural space, but they do that typically down in not just any lumbar spine, but typically in the three, four, the L4, L3 region. So their goal, as you've mentioned, is to get into the epidural space. You don't want to uh, go into the vertebral uh, cavity, but on the off chance, because mom wiggles or you've just got a nervous intern or whatever, uh, is it possible that it could penetrate into that space? Yes. And so by doing it lower in the L4, L3 region, uh, you are able to make sure you're not going to, that if you go in too deep, you're not going to hit the spinal cord. So the reason they do those epidurals so low is so that uh, there is no risk of hitting the spinal cord if it should actually and accidentally go in too deep. The spinal cord is a, you know, like I said, tube uh, structure about the thickness of your thumb a little bit more, but there are two areas, the cervical region and the lumbar region where it is slightly larger, where you get an enlargement of the spinal cord. Why might you get an enlargement of the spinal cord in those regions? What do you think might be happening in those regions that would cause them to get bigger? All right. Maybe more extensions or? Yeah, exactly. There are more nerves coming into and out of them. And why do you think there are more nerves coming into and out of them in these two regions? Why don't we have an enlargement right here in the middle? What part of the body do you think that goes to? Yeah, goes to the trunk. Where do you think the cervical enlargement, the nerves are coming into and out of? To your hands. And your yeah, arm. the arm, absolutely. You have a lot more nerves coming in and out of your arm than you do out of your trunk. So then what do you think the lumbar enlargement is for? Uh, your legs. Yeah, your legs. Thank you for not making me wave, have to wave my leg in front of the screen. I appreciate that. Excellent. Now, notice that while the uh, spinal cord terminates at about the L1, L2 region of the vertebral column, uh, the rest of the vertebral column isn't empty. So the terminal end is a bit specialized. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Here, we see an up close view of what this looks like. And the first thing that you should notice is that the spinal cord doesn't just stop abruptly. It actually tapers down into this kind of arrow pointing, or dare I say, cone shape type of structure. And so this narrow cone shape region at the end of the spinal cord is known as the conus medullaris. However, the axons, oh, actually, um, we haven't talked about the protective coverings for our uh, spinal cord yet, but not surprisingly, they're going to be similar to the protections of the brain. And so once again, there is going to be that pia matter, that shrink wrap that wraps around the outer surface of this. Those collagen fibers from that pia matter actually extend beyond the conus medullaris and actually attach to the sacrum, helping to anchor and stabilize the spinal cord in place. This structure is known as the phylum terminale. Now, one of the things that can happen if an individual undergoes a rapid growth spurt as the body is expanding, do these collagen fibers expand as easily as well? No. No. And so what can end up happening is that the spinal cord can actually get pulled down by that cord as the person is growing taller. And that can actually cause nerves to start to kink. 
So people can start to get tremendous weakness in their appendages, a lot of pain or numbness uh, from this type of condition. And how do you think they resolve it? Well, if you've got a rope that is pulling your spinal cord where it doesn't want to go, what do you do? You cut it. You cut the rope, exactly. And that's what they'll do. They'll actually go in and cut that phylum terminalis. And typically the uh, symptoms go away almost immediately. Now, doesn't that mean that your spinal cord is whipping around inside of your vertebral column a lot more? No, not necessarily, because you've got lots of other things in there that are protecting it and stabilizing it in place. Is it maybe slightly less stable? Sure. But considering that you couldn't move your arms or your legs, or you were having incredible pain in your arms and your legs, I think it's worth like a teeny bit less stability to your spinal cord uh, to alleviate those issues. Now, again, as we mentioned, this space isn't empty. All of the axons from the neurons going into and out of the spinal cord continue, yeah, orange is just a horrible color, uh, continue to extend down in this space to find their exits and leave out the sacral foramina or out the intervertebral foramina of the lower parts of the vertebrae. So we have a lot of axons that are coming down here forming these long, straight, coarse looking structures, which make it look like a horse's tail. Do not use the term horse's tail on the exam. You will not even get partial credit if you use the term horse's tail, but that's where it gets its name. Cade Aquina, tail of the horse. So these are the axons coming out of the spinal cord, going down to their destinations, forming this long draping structure here at the inferior portion of the spinal cord. Now, as I mentioned a little later in class today, we are gonna learn everything you ever wanted to know about the 12 pairs of cranial nerves. We have 31 pairs of spinal nerves. And the good news is you're not going to have to memorize all of those. Not surprisingly, they are named in a very similar fashion to our vertebrae. That's way too big. So just like we saw in our vertebrae, what are the three flavors of vertebrae that we have? Cervical, thoracic, and lumbar. Then we have the two composite bones at the bottom. What are they? Sacrum and coccyx. Excellent. So when we learned about the bones, How many cervical uh, vertebrae do we have? Seven. Seven. How many thoracic? Twelve. How many lumbar? Five. Now we have one sacrum and one coccyx. How many bones fuse together to form the sacrum? Anyone remember? Five, excellent. How many bones fuse together to form the coccyx? One. Well, four, but you're right. It happens so early that it basically becomes one tiny little bone. So we can go ahead and go with one there. And if we were to add all those together, how many uh, bones would we say then made up the Did we, how many bones have we identified here? 30, exactly. The exact same number that we have for the spinal nerves. Do 
All right. Questions on that? Ah, there you go. That's what I was waiting for. Exactly. Notice there is indeed one more spinal nerve than there are bones. And that is because it turns out there are eight cervical nerves, then 12 thoracic, then five lumbar, then five sacral, then one coccyx. So why there is that difference is because of the cervical. And if you look closely at this picture, you can see why. Notice, for instance, in the thoracic region, the thoracic nerve T8, no, oh, that's way too big. The thoracic nerve T8 comes out underneath the T8 vertebrae. But if we come up here to the cervical, Notice C1 goes above the C1. What was C1 again? What was the other name for vertebrae C1? The atlas. Atlas, there you go. Two goes above two, three goes above three, four goes above four, five goes above five, six goes above six, seven goes above seven. So then C8, the extra one comes under seven and then T1 is under T1 and T2 is under T2. So the first cranial, uh, first spinal nerve goes above the vertebrae and that's why we get an extra nerve. So 30 bones, 31 nerves. I've got another picture that shows this really nicely as well. Notice they're named basically by the vertebrae they're associated with. Their cranials go above, uh, pardon me, the cervical goes above, everything else goes below. And notice this also shows us how we get the caudae equina. Notice because the spinal cord stops at the L1, L2 region, the nerves, the axons have to continue to go down to get to the sacral, to get to the coccyx region. And so they have to go further and further down the vertebral column forming that Cade Aquina. So it's those nerves trying to get to, or the axons really trying to get to those exit points, the intervertebral foramen or the sacral foramen to come out to form those spinal nerves. Now, as we'll see in a minute when we draw this, as we finish talking about, axons can either go into or out of the spinal cord. And as we mentioned, those coming into are sensory, they're the afferent ones. Those coming out of, or efferent, are the motor ones. And all spinal nerves have both sensory and motor axons in them. So if you cut the nerve going to my finger, not only can I not move my finger, but I can't feel anything with my finger as well we call these mixed nerves. I make a point of emphasizing this because when we get to our cranial nerves, some cranial nerves will be mixed, but some will be just sensory and some will be just motor. In fact, we'll have a good mnemonic to help us to figure that out. But we don't need a mnemonic for the spinal nerves because all 31 of them, 31 pairs of them, are all mixed nerves. They all contain both sensory and motor information. And we'll see that when we form one. Now, before we finish the spinal cord, let's talk a little bit about nerves. Nerves, as we've already indicated, are a bundle of axons. Kind of like a muscle is a bundle of muscle cells, All right? A muscle is a bundle of muscle cells. Well, a nerve is a bundle of axons. When we made a muscle, did we just randomly throw a bunch of muscle cells together? No. No, they were organized by connective tissues.
So when we make a nerve, do you think we are going to just throw a bunch of axons together? No. No. They are also going to be organized by connective tissues. In a way, that might be very similar to us with our muscle cell. Each individual muscle cell had a connective tissue that wrapped around it. What type of connective tissue was it? Endomysium. Well, that's what we called it based on its location, but what was the tissue type? Areolar, excellent connective tissue, but you are absolutely correct. Based on that location, we called it what again? The endomysium. Endo means within, mesium refers to muscle. Well, notice this axon has an areolar connective tissue wrapped around it, that based on its location, we can't call a mesium because it's not muscle, but we can call it endo, Nurium. This axon and its areolar connective tissue and 14 of its buddies are bound together into these structures. What do you think we call this structure? What did we call it in muscle cells? Fascicle, excellent. Nothing muscle in the name with that, so we can reuse the term fascicle again. What type of tissue did we use to form the fascicle? Dense regular. Excellent. And what did we call it based on its location? Paramecium. So what are we going to call this one here on our nerve? Perineary. There you go. Oops. Excellent. Notice a bunch of fascicles plus some blood vessels are bound together by yet another connective tissue. Right, this structure is the nerve, just like the structure in our muscle was the muscle. What was the tissue type that bundled everything together to make the muscle? Dense regular. And what did we call it based on its location? Epimysium. So what are we gonna call this one? There you go. Notice we already learned this exact anatomy once with muscles. And here we are using this exact same anatomy, this exact same structure, the exact same verge, verbiage, epi, peri, and endo, to identify the components of a nerve. The same way a muscle is organized is basically the same way a nerve is organized. So there you go, exactly. Learn something once, you get to use it twice. Excellent. There we go. Now, we can see this nicely with an illustration, like of this illustration here, but, whoops. <coughs> now, hold on. Just like we were responsible for seeing what the, no, not the one I wanted. Where is it? I don't have it. The same way we needed to be able to recognize the muscle. Wait, what did I do?
There we go. Histologically, we need to be recognized a nerve histologically. Here, we actually see a couple nerves, right? Notice these bundles of nerves, these are actually multiple nerves together, have all of this tissue between them. Any idea what this tissue might be? Is that the areolar? No, no, what does it look like? Well, it's even more obvious than areolar. Areolar is always a good guess. Yeah, 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 clearly this is adipose, absolutely. But what we can see very nicely, let me make sure how this works. Here is a nerve where we can see that epi Nureum around the outer surface, bundling them all together, along with some blood vessels. Notice here, you can see really, really nicely the perineurium going around and forming the individual fascicles. So we can see that really nicely. Notice we can't see much what's going in inside the nerve at this magnification, but I wanted you to see what it looked like uh, from a low magnification. But if we increase, the magnification, we can see some really, really nice stuff. Notice here, we are looking at a super up close view uh, of this. So clearly this, as it mentions here, is the perineurium forming a fascicle. And the way we can tell that, and let me actually switch to the line rather than the highlighter, is notice there are all these donut shaped structures. What do you think the white part in the middle is? Fluid possibly, or? Not a bad guess. It, it, it's a fluid filled tube, it's the axon. So if the white part is the axon, what's the circle around it? The myelin sheath? Exactly. So these big dark circles that you see are the myelin sheath. And then notice in the space in between, that would be the areolar connective tissue, insulating and isolating them from each other. Notice this is a nice stain, but this is another great one where we see that really nicely, all those little donut shapes, but this is my favorite picture. This is a stain that specifically stains myelin. So notice here, what I love about this stain is you can very, very clearly see where the myelin is. And then obviously what's in the middle of it is the axon. And what's outside of it is the endoneurium. So we can clearly see that there is that space for the areolar connective tissue. We're not seeing the tissue, but we know this space has to be filled with something. And so this something that is filling this space would be that areolar connective tissue that is our endoneurium. But I love how dark and distinct it makes the axons, which makes it really, really obvious to tell. And then clearly also here we can see the perineurium, which would be forming the fascicle, bundling it up. All right, so we've seen it in illustration, we've seen it histologically. Questions on that? Oh, this one? Uh, yeah, this is just a big axon. All righty, excellent. Oop, and there we go, even closer. Makes me happy. All righty. Oh, let's do this too. So a nerve is a bundle of myelinated axons. So one of the things that you can do to a nerve is tease it apart. 
basically using a couple of needles, you are able to actually, come on. Whoa, what just happened? Let's try this again. Here, perfect. Tease it apart. Now, notice when you tease it apart, are you going to be able to perfectly break apart the strands of an axon without uh, this, all the individual strands of axon without doing any damage? No. No, of course not. And you can see plenty of broken edges where this is located. However, notice, and here's a great place to look. This dark structure that you see is indeed an axon, but do you think you're actually seeing the axon? Well, I'm asking the question, so what's the obvious answer? No. No, exactly. The answer is no. So what are you seeing? The myelin sheath. Exactly. What you're seeing is the myelin sheath. And if this was a nerve, which tells us it's in the peripheral nervous system, what type of cell would be making this myelin? The Schwann. Schwann cells, excellent. And as we know, do Schwann cells cover the entire surface of an axon? Mm -mm. No. no. And so notice if you look closely here, oh, the purple doesn't show up well. Notice, you can actually see the little bulb where it ends, and then you can see the bulb of the next one where it stops. So notice if you, if you look closely, you can see that there is a tiny gap right there. Notice there's another really obvious tiny gap that you can see right here, the space between the two uh, Schwann cells. And what would these spaces be that my arrows are pointing at? Nodes. The nodes. Oh, look, there's another really great node right here as well. You can see that. There's another one. It's a little harder to see because of the damage, but you can see another one right there. And I think I actually have an up close view. Yeah, there we go. Ah, awesome. Notice very, very clearly at this high resolution, you can very, very clearly see those spaces between the, sw the swan cells, which are our nodes, which is where our action potential is jumping to. Excellent. All right, questions on that? All right, perfect. That is good because now I believe the only thing we have left uh, is the anatomy of the spinal cord and its protections. So the good news is the protections of the spinal cord are going to be similar to the protections of our brain. However, there's one big difference between the brain and the spinal cord. The brain is located in the cranial cavity, but it covered by the, uh, by the skull bones. And do the skull bones move? No. No. Whereas your spinal cord is protected by the vertebrae. And do your vertebrae move? Yes. 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 So while we're gonna have the same three layers of the meninges, there are going to be some differences that are going to help to support and provide protection and also flexibility of movement. This is a great picture here, but let's actually just go ahead and draw it. So what we need is a nice big, we'll simplify things by going square. Actually, let's make it black. So here is our spinal cord. 
And this time we're gonna work our way out. We know there needs to be a shrink wrapped layer of protection that stabilizes the tissue and stabilizes the blood vessels in place. And what are we gonna call this shrink wrap layer that is right on the surface of the tissue? Pia matter. Exactly. Perfect. Above that, we are going to have a fibrous connective tissue that has a lot of collagen fibers that come off of it, giving it a very cobwebby appearance. What would we call this layer? Excellent, arachnoid matter. And what would we call the space underneath the arachnoid matter? The space would be arachnoid space. Yeah, the subarachnoid space. And what does it contain? Uh, cerebral spinal fluid. Excellent. Notice so far there's nothing different. Now, on top of this, we're going to have our double layer. of dense irregular connective tissue, our thick fibrous tough mother. And what did we call that? Dura matter, excellent. And remember, we mentioned before how in our cranial cavity, there is a potential space here called the subdural space, but here it's an actual space. And this actual space contains not cerebral spinal fluid, but interstitial fluid. Again, the cerebral spinal fluid plays an important role in helping to bathe and provide information and nourishment and remove wastes from the nervous tissue. That's not the goal of this here. The goal of this here is instead to provide that additional protection, that additional cushion, as this thing has to be able to flex and move and bend. And notice one other thing. In the nerve, uh, in the brain, the second layer of the dura matter was the periosteum, the inner layer of the bone. That is not the case here. The dura matter is a separate and independent structure from the periosteum. And so what that means is there is a space between the periosteum and the dura above the dura matter. And so what do we call this space above the dura matter? Come on, this is the easy one. Is it epidural? Exactly. This epidural space contains adipose and a real arc connective tissue. It provides protection and cushions the spinal cord. And remember, as we talked about, if you're having a baby, 
it is into this space that they will release the anesthetic so that that anesthetic can then diffuse through the structures and numb the nerves. Notice as we talked about, the goal is to get in the space and nowhere near the protections of the spinal cord. Because if you went too deep, yes, clearly you could hit the spinal cord and cause damage. But even if you punctured into the dura or the subarachnoid space, that can actually cause some of that cerebral spinal fluid to drain out. And as that cerebral spinal fluid drains out, that can cause terrible migraine-like headaches uh, and other complications as a result of that. So it's one of the risks uh, that you take when you have the epidural is that you can have those types of side effects from it if the needle is inserted too deeply. But that's why the goal is to do it inferior to the spinal cord and just barely enter into this space so that uh, you don't avoid all of those potential complications. Now, I appreciate this is a very simplistic illustration, but if we look at the pretty picture from your textbook, we see all of these exact same things. Notice for them, here we have the bone, and then deep to the bone, we have the epidural space filled with that adipose and that areolar connective tissue. Then we have our thick dura matter. Underneath that, we have the actual subdural space that, as we mentioned, contains interstitial fluid. From there, things look a lot more familiar. We have our arachnoid matter, our subarachnoid space, and then our pia matter, which stabilizes the blood vessels, uh, the axons and holds the tissue in place. Uh, Aubrey, that's a great question. Um, I don't think there's a set time. A lot of it has to do with how large of a hole is formed, how much cerebral spinal fluid leaks out. And even if you know it's five milliliters, that five milliliters isn't gonna have the same effect on person A that it would have on person B. So there isn't, uh, there isn't necessarily a set time. I know in some instances, uh, it can last weeks uh, where they can have complications. Now, usually it starts to slowly get better during that time, but yeah, they can have migraine-like headaches that can last weeks as a result of it. So again, we talked about getting that epidural is a big question because there are some, while there are definitely some benefits to it, there's also some potential risks to it as well. All righty, so those are the protective coverings. Questions on that? All right, what we need to do next then is now actually just talk about the actual spinal cord itself and its anatomy. We've already talked about it a little bit, uh, but we've got a lot more to do and there's a lot of vocabulary involved in this. So this is another good stopping point. Let's go ahead and take our second break here. It looks like it's 10 o'clock on the button. So we will restart at 10.15. And um, that should hopefully give us enough time to get through most of the cranial nerves. That should work. 10.15 and we will pick up from there and I will start the recording at that time. All right. Great question. Any others before we take our next break? All righty, I'll see you guys in 15 minutes. We just finished talking about the protections of the spinal cord, but we still have this big gray oval in the center. So let's take a closer look at that. Like our cerebrum, like our um, cerebellum, we have our spinal cord and our spinal cord has hemispheres, two halves. We can tell this 
uh, by two invaginations that are along the midlines. Notice I didn't draw the symmetrical because that's one of the characteristics we can use to distinguish the front of the spinal cord from the back of the spinal cord. Now, this invagination here, the smaller one is the posterior median um, sulcus. Let's do this. Because it's that groove, that invagination. However, the one in the front is bigger. So guess what we call that? Well, what's bigger than a sulcus? A fissure. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So we have the anterior median fissure. At the center, and I'll make it a little bit larger than normal so that I'm able to write in it. We know we have our central canal. Now, this central canal contains what? Cerebral spinal fluid. Exactly, cerebral spinal fluid. And it happens to be lined on its inner surface by an epithelial-like glial cell that helps to support and maintain that cerebral spinal fluid. So what type of cells do you think line our central canal? They're astrocytes. Uh, that was one of our glial cells, but not the one that is like epithelial-like, not the one that helps us to maintain our cerebral spinal fluid, make and maintain the cerebral spinal fluid. Oh, epi. epi it's epidymal. Yeah, there you go. Our central canal is lined with epidymal cells. Excellent. All righty. As we talked about, uh, like, unlike the cerebrum, unlike the cerebellum, with our spinal cord, our gray matter is deep and our white matter is superficial. And so when we draw this, it has kind of a butterfly-like shape to it where there are three main enlargements. And by far the biggest enlargement is towards the front. And so we call these uh, extensions of gray matter, the gray horns. And so this is the anterior gray horn. That makes the one to the back, posterior gray horn. And what does that make the one to the side? Lateral gray horn. Exactly. Perfect. And if we are going to name the gray matter, we need to name the white matter as well. Uh, the white matter is known as columns because after all, these are the ascending and descending axons. So we have the posterior white column. The anterior white column. And the lateral white column. And notice anywhere I've used anterior and posterior, remember I can also use dorsal and ventral. By convention, and again, that just is the rule that anatomists make up. When talking about the gray matter, they tend to use anterior and posterior. 
but it's not required. And we see this because as we mentioned, we know we have to have axons coming into and out of the spinal cord. The axons associated with the front are known as the ventral root, but again, you could call it the anterior root. And the ones associated with the back are the dorsal root. And if you remember, there is an enlarged structure that is gonna contain sensory neurons in it on that dorsal root. And what was that structure called again? The dorsal root ganglion. Excellent. Excellent. These roots come together. And when they come together, they leave between the vertebrae in the intervertebral foramen. And when they leave out the intervertebral foramen, they form the spinal nerve. So the roots come together to form the nerves. So this is the anatomy of our spinal cord. Notice we've done it here nicely in the picture and we can look at it from the pretty picture from your textbook as well. We have the gray matter and the white matter. We have uh, the uh, posterior and anterior uh, median, right, uh, fissures and um, uh, and uh, the uh, so the anterior or ventral median fissure, posterior or dorsal median sulcus. I know this one looks the same size as this one. Again, artistic uh, representation. Central canal at the center, and everything that goes along with that. Notice we also have the nerves. We have our ventral root and our dorsal root and our dorsal root ganglion, and they come together to form the spinal nerve. All right, now, one of the things we know about the nervous system is now that we've identified all of these locations, we know that these locations, especially the gray matter, are going to be associated with neurons. And if we know the location of a neuron, what else do we know about the neuron? The structure and function. Exactly. So let's form our dorsal root and our ventral root and our spinal nerve. Uh, I don't like this one. and start identifying this. Now, one of the things you may recall is we've actually talked about this anterior root before. In this anterior root is where we find most of the neurons in the spinal cord. So here in the anterior root, does anybody remember what the function of this neuron was? or maybe the structure. We looked at this in the spinal cord smear. 
Multipolar. Multipolar, absolutely. So this is a neuron that has multiple dendrites and its axon leaves the ventral root out the spinal nerve and will actually synapse on skeletal muscle cells. So based on that, what must its function be? Motor. And you get partial credit for that, but we can be more specific. Somatic. There we go. Motor. Somatic motor, perfect. Absolutely perfect. There we go. Somatic motor. Notice we also, we just mentioned this dorsal root ganglion had a bunch of neurons that we saw in them. Remember, they were easy to recognize because they had those satellite cells uh, that were wrapped around the outer surface. And here in the dorsal root ganglion, what did we say the structural classification of the neurons we saw here were? Remember, we just saw those circles with the satellite cells around them. We really didn't see any processes coming out of them because how many processes do they have coming out of them? The yeah, one. So these are the unipolar, where they have just that one process. Oops. One process coming out. Uh, do this. And then they carry that information into the posterior root. And does anybody remember what the function of these were? Sensory neurons. Exactly. So basically they're receiving sensory information from inside or outside the body. And they are carrying it, bringing that information into the spinal cord to be processed. That leaves us one more region, the lateral gray horn. Now, I will tell you right off the bat that the lateral gray horn well, let's do it this way. The function of the lateral gray horn is autonomic motor. Remember, that's why we had to specify somatic motor for the anterior gray horn. So it talks to autonomic motor. So what would its effectors be? What would it be communicating to? Smooth muscle. Smooth muscle. What else? Glands. Glands and? Cardiac yeah. muscle. Yeah. Excellent. Now, based on that, what must its structural classification be? Multipolar. Multipolar, excellent. So it is going to have multiple dendrites coming off of it. And it's axon. Where do you think it's more likely to go? Do you think it would want to go out the ventral route where the somatic motor are going? Or do you think it's going to want to swim upstream on the dorsal route with all those sensory axons? Mm -hmm. 
Is it easier to go with the flow or is it easier to go upstream? I'll go with the flow. Go with yeah, the flow. Exactly. So it is also going to come out the eventual route to synapse on our smooth muscle, our cardiac muscle and our glands. Notice our ventral root then only has motor axons. So it only has motor uh, axons in it. Our dorsal root only has sensory axons in it. And remember, as we mentioned, our spinal, spinal nerve is a mixed nerve. That means it has both sensory and motor axons. So we see these three large gray matter locations, dorsal root ganglion, the lateral gray horn, and the anterior gray horn. They are locations that contain neuron cell bodies that have specific functions and specific structural classifications. Location, function, structure. Notice if I tell you a neuron is autonomic motor, I've given you one piece of information. Can you tell me its structural classification? Yes. What is it? Multipolar. And where would its cell body be located? In the lateral gray horn. Excellent. And what would its effector be? What is it going to synapse on? Smooth muscle and cardiac uh, glands. Exactly. And so just that easily, we can put these pieces together. Notice your book does a really nice job of doing this as well. Notice here we have this simple illustration. Again, notice in the posterior gray horn, this is where the sensory information is coming in. Notice we're not worrying about distinguishing somatic versus visceral. We just know it's all the sensory. But our visceral motor is in the lateral gray horn. Our somatic motor is in the anterior gray horn. We talked about the white matter. And again, do you think the axons are just randomly thrown in there? In the mm -hmm. white matter of the spinal cord? No, of course not. Notice if you look at this great picture from your textbook, we can see all of the in blue ascending sensory tracks coming up and in red, the motor descending going down. However, if you look at your anatomy list, I'm not holding you responsible for knowing any of these particular tracks, but I just wanted you to see that it's not just random axons. They're just like the gray matter is organized, the white matter is organized as well. So yes, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, when you get to a neurobiology class, then you can learn about these uh, ascending and descending tracks, but we don't have to worry about that right now. And as we mentioned, our dorsal or posterior root just has sensory axons in it. Our ventral just has the motor going out. And then our spinal nerve is the, uh, we'll get to that in a second. Our spinal nerve is what comes out and it is a mixed nerve. All right. Questions on that? All right, let me look at this picture to see if I've left myself enough room. I have not. So let's cheat. Here's our spinal cord, or at least half of it. our dorsal root, our ventral root, and our spinal nerve. How many spinal nerves did we say we had? 31 pairs. Excellent. 
Does that mean you just have 31 nerves going to 31 locations in your body and those are the only places that get axons going to and from them? No, of course not. Once the spinal nerve comes out, almost immediately after it exits out the intervertebral foramen, so again, let's put the little vertebrae here. As it passes out the intervertebral foramen, the spinal nerve branches, not once, but not twice, but into four distinct branches. The largest of these branches or arms, because that's a name we've used before, is the ventral ramus. The ventral ramus basically goes to the sides and front of the body and to all of the limbs. Not surprisingly, it's the largest of the arms that comes off. Next is the dorsal arm, dorsal ramus. It primarily goes to the skin and the muscles of the back, posterior side of the body. And then we have these two additional branches. These two additional branches collectively are known as rami, because rami is the plural of, of ramus. Communicantes, which is incredibly fun to say. Rami communicantes uh, is them collectively, but individually they are the white ramus. and the gray ramus. The gray ramus, notice, is the one that is medial, closer to the spinal cord, and the white ramus is the one that is lateral. So occasionally, not often, but occasionally, you'll see them referred to as the lateral ramus and the medial ramus, but white and gray is more common. And then, like I said, collectively, they are the rami communicantes. And these basically carry motor and sensory information from the internal organs, the inside of the body. This actually plays a huge role in our sympathetic pathways. So we will talk about these in much more detail when we get to the autonomic nervous system. So we have these four branches that come off. And notice if we look at the pretty picture from the textbook, we see this as well. Beautiful. Notice here, as we look at this, we can see the spinal nerve coming out of the intervertebral foramen. Then we have our dorsal ramus going to the muscles and the skin of the back. Our ventral ramus going to the side and the front of the body, and this would also be which would go to a limb if we had that there. And then notice we have these two much smaller rami communicantes. Again, incredibly fun to say, uh, but again, we have the lateral one, which is white, and the medial one, which is gray. And here's one more picture that shows these. Again, notice spinal nerves comes out, dorsal ramus going to the back, ventral ramus going to the front of the limbs, and then our two white and gray rami going to one of our autonomic ganglia, sympathetic ganglia. So it's gonna be part of our autonomic nervous system. Like I said, we'll talk about that much more uh, next week, actually. All right.
Questions on that? Excellent. Good news is that should be all the information you need to be able to answer your uh, nervous system review. If you haven't already, uh, you started working on that. You can probably start working on that now because uh, that will help you uh, to be successful for that. And you can follow that that way. However, what we have left to do now, and we'll start now and then go from there, is our cranial nerves. Oh, and actually, let's do one more thing before I show you this. Hopefully, you have already printed it out. If you haven't printed it out, you don't need to. You can actually just make this graph or this chart for yourself. but I've provided you with this to hopefully help you to be successful organizing this information. Your book does a really, really excellent job of being able to provide you with this information, but it's a lot of information and it's an important part of the exam. So I think it is worthwhile uh, to be able to uh, go over this together. However, it also can be intimidating when you first look at it. So let's really emphasize the things on here that you are going to be responsible for. Basically on the exam, oh, but let's cheat with one more thing, hold on. Wonder if Cosumnes River site's got a good picture of this. There we go, perfect, that is exactly what I want. Here is a great picture of one of the models that is in the classroom and I guarantee this will be on the exam or something very similar to it. On this, you are going to be responsible for identifying basically four pieces of information. The first is identifying the nerves. So let's do that first. Cranial nerve one comes off of here. This is cranial nerve two. This tiny little thing sticking out here is cranial nerve three. This is cranial nerve four, five, six, seven, eight. Not actually do it up here because it's easier. Nine, 10, 11, and 12. So you need to, obviously they're paired just like uh, the spinal nerves are, and there are 12 of them. So obviously the first thing you're gonna need to do is be able to find them on a model or an illustration, like from your textbook, here's a very simple, very basic illustration that shows this as well. And the very first piece of information, when I point at one of those nerves, you're gonna be responsible for, Oops, why is that not writing? Is the name and number. There are 12 and they are numbered. Notice by convention, again, a rule that anatomists have made up, they use Roman numerals to uh, identify them. You are encouraged to use Roman numerals, but it is not required. So if I point at cranial nerve eight and you wanna use the Arabic eight instead of V-I-I-I, -I, I am perfectly acceptable with that. So you may use the Arabic numbers or the Roman numbers, I'm fine with either. But you need to know the name, you need to know the number. And I have provided you with a mnemonic to help you to remember these. Notice the mnemonic for it is up here. Oh, once one takes the anatomy final, very good vacations are heavenly. So notice you put the first letter of each of these. Oh, oh, oh. T, and I'm not going to do for all of them, but T, and you get the idea. 
And this mnemonic helps you to remember. So for instance, the first O, O, what is the first cranial nerve? What do you think? Anyone know? Olfactory, there you go. So there you go. That mnemonic helps you to remember that. Again, this is a nice PG version of a mnemonic. I'm sure if you do a quick web search, you can find plenty of uh, PG-13 uh, uh, versions of this. Uh, mine is more uh, not suitable for work, the one that I learned when I was in graduate school. So no, I will not be sharing that one with you. Uh, but I'm sure a quick Google search will find you sent plenty of more entertaining mnemonics to help you to remember uh, your cranial nerves and that first piece of information you are responsible for, name and number. The second piece of information you're going to be responsible for is functional type. When we talk about functional type, basically what we are saying is which direction does it carry information? And if you think about it, how many possible answers are there for this? Two. Okay, what would they be? Or think of it this way, these are nerves. What type of information can they carry? Sensory and motor. Sensory and motor. Now, if it's sensory, it's coming into the central nervous system. So we called that, right, afferent coming in. Motor, we called efferent and it is going out. However, are those really the only two options? There's mixed. Exactly, where it's both in and out. So if I ask you functional type, there is only three possible answers. So if you see the question functional type, you've got a 33% chance of getting it right. And once again, to help you with this, I've given you a mnemonic. Now, notice in this case, sensory, motor, we couldn't use mix because mix and motor both start with M. So instead we use B for both. And you see here, some say merry money, but my brother says big brains matter most. So again, for our mnemonic here, some, whoops, say, marry, money, and so on and so forth. And again, we can do the rest of it. So let's continue the one we were just talking about, olfactory. Based on its name, olfactory, what do you think it is? Do you think it's sensory, motor, or both? Sensory, exactly. So functional type is basically another way of saying, which way does it carry the information? And in this case, or what type of information does it carry? In this case, it carries sensory. However, while it's useful to know that it carries sensory information, don't we also kind of need to know specifically what it does? Yeah. So what is the specific function of our olfactory nerve? What kind of information, sensory information, is it actually carrying into our brain? Smell. Yeah. Olfaction, if you want to be fast, fancy, but smell, smell, our sense of smell. And that leaves us with one more piece of information we need to know, how it gets to its destination. 
how does these are coming off of the brain and going to parts of our body. So they need to leave the skull. And luckily, way back at the beginning of this class, we learned a bunch of exits to the skull, a bunch of holes in the skull that things could pass through. And what did we say our olfactory nerves pass through to get into the nasal cavity so that we could provide that sense of smell to our brain? The olfactory foramina. In the cribriform plate, in the ethmoid bone. And there you go. Just that easily, without looking at any pictures, we filled out all the information you're going to be responsible for for the first cranial nerve. You need to know the name and number, the functional type, the specific function, which is what it actually does. And you need to know the skull exit which is basically the bone hole it leaves the cranial cavity through. Those are the four pieces of information that I will ask you about on the exam. Now notice there is one additional column that I have provided you for here. Brain exit. Members, I mentioned the first thing you have to do is be able to recognize it on the image. So this is the place, the brain exit is where you can write where to find it. This is a, a, a clue to help you so that when you're looking at that picture, you can see and remember where it is. Now, some of these, it's gonna be easy. The olfactory nerve is a perfect example. The olfactory nerve actually comes off of the olfactory bulb. So if we find the olfactory bulb, we can find where cranial nerve one is. But again, you can write whatever you want here to make sense of you. This is not something I'm going to ask you on the exam. This is something that you can provide for yourself so that when you're looking at the picture, you can see what it is that you're trying to see. All right. Questions on this? You mentioned that this is going to be a majority of our lab exam. No, I said this is going to be 20. Uh, this could be as much as 25% of your lab okay. exam. 50% of your lab exam is all the brain anatomy, the protective layers, the, the, the spaces that we just finished doing. That's 50% of your lab exam. This could be close to 25. Your autonomic will be close to 25. If we get to any sensory stuff, then uh, sensory structures, then that can take away from these two. But if we don't get to any sensory, sensory anatomy, this will be about 25% of your lab exam. Okay, thank you. All right, do we understand how to play the game? Yeah. Excellent, so again, uh, I can't keep this here, so let's go to our whiteboard and put our two mnemonics numbers. Um, names and functional type. And I'll use the uh, Arabic numbers just to make it easy. What's our mnemonic for the names again? Oh, once one takes the anatomy final, very good vacations are heavenly. Uh, 
Excellent. Let's cheat a little bit, find these up. Screw it. All right, that's too much work, I don't care. Excellent. And what's our mnemonic for the functional type? What, sorry, what was the question? Functional type. What was the mnemonic for the functional type? Oh, some say marry money, but my brother says big brains matter most. Money, but my brother says big brains matter most. And again, this is something that you've got that whiteboard you can bring up. Or, uh, and if you wanted to mind dump this mnemonic on your whiteboard at the beginning of your lab exam to help you to remember that, that's a perfect opportunity to place to keep that to help you as we go through all of these. So there's our mnemonic. We're gonna put that up in our corner. And then as we talked about, there are basically four pieces of information we're gonna be responsible for. Name and number. When you say name and number, they go together on the answer. Like if you yeah. ask, a, okay. But, and I will specifically say name and number. Functional type. Specific function. Skull exit. And as I mentioned, we already did number one. What was number one? Olfactory. Excellent. What is its functional type? Sensory. Excellent. What is its specific function? Small. Excellent. And what's its skull exit? Olfactory foramina. Plural. Excellent. And like I said, just that easily, we've done the first one. So there you go. Now I've got it someplace where it's more permanent. Let's go back and look at the pretty pictures. Notice this illustration does a great job of actually showing us our first cranial nerve. Uh, the way I always think of this is to think of it in terms of a brush. Right. Obviously, taking care of hair is something that I uh, do a lot of. And so if you think about a brush, a brush has a handle, a brush has a head, and then a brush has bristles that come off of it. That's basically what we're looking at here. The handle is the olfactory tract. The head is the olfactory bulb. And the bristles that come off of it are the olfactory nerve. Notice technically, if we go back to this picture, the model, does the model actually have the olfactory nerve on it? No. No. Well, it has the bulb, but it doesn't have the bristles coming off of it. So I could cheat by saying identify the cranial nerve that would come off of this structure but I can't actually just point there and say identify the cranial nerve because there's actually no cranial nerve in this picture, no cranial nerve one in this picture. Luckily, our illustration here does a nice job of showing it by giving us those little nerves that are coming off of it, the axons that are coming off of it. Notice also when you look at a real brain, the nerves get stuck in those cribriform plates and get ripped off. So you, again, you see the bulb but you don't see the nerves typically for cranial nerve one. Here's the nice table that again shows us olfactory has a sensory function, no motor function, so it is sensory, optic sensory, ocular motor, motor. So we can see again, it tells us those specific functional types. And here we get a great view of the actual cranial nerve 
one. Those bundles of axons coming off of the olfactory bulb. But notice it's not a single structure. It really are like filaments of that brush passing through all those olfactory foramina, providing us with our sensories, a sense of smell. So again, cranial nerve one olfactory, functional type sensory, specific function smell, skull exit, cribriform plates, olfactory foramina. Or ethmoid, or really if you just say, if you say olfactory foramina, I will accept that. You don't have to put in the cribriform plate, you don't have to put ethmoid, just put olfactory foramina and I will be satisfied with that. Excellent. Let's do another easy one. What's cranial nerve two? Optic nerve. With a name like that, what do you think its functional type is? Sensory. What is its specific function? Right. Excellent. And how does it get to the eyeball? Anyone um, remember that VIP exit that we had in the sphenoid bone that just the optic nerve could pass through? Uh, you guys thought you were done with bones and bone features, didn't you? Isn't it the fissure, the superior? There is a superior orbital fissure, but that's a big general opening. Something as important as vision. Optic yeah, optic foramen or the optic canal, remember? Canal, or you can use the term foramen. Absolutely. Let's take a look at that one. Remember, we just finished talking about the optic nerve, how it comes to the optic chiasm, carrying that visual information. So again, there are lots of ways you could describe its brain exit. It comes off of the optic chiasm. That's a structure we're responsible for. We know it carries information to the thalamus, the lateral geniculate nucleus. Right. And it's also the only one that comes off of the diencephalon. So you could also think of it in terms of cephalons as well. Again, I don't care. Whatever helps you to be able to find it. Notice if we cheat and go back, right? There's cranial nerve too. So whatever helps you to be able to recognize that. And notice even on the real brain, is it pretty easy to find the optic nerves? Yes. Yeah, right, right above where the pituitary would be, those nice little V-shaped structures helping to form that part of that X at the top. So hopefully that is something that is easy. And remember, we talked about that VIP entrance where it crosses, that information crosses, right? Notice, in fact, if we look at the inside of the orbit of the eye, as someone mentioned, we have this nice big, superior orbital fissure, but that's a nice big general opening. Something as important as vision needs its own uh, velvet roped VIP entrance. That VIP entrance that only the optic nerve can pass through is that optic foramen or optic canal, both would be acceptable. So if someone pulls out their eyeball with the nerve be attached to it? Ew. <laughs> um, I think, well, okay, so I guess probably the famous example of that is any given Sunday, the guy gets his eye popped out in that. Uh, honestly, there's so many connective tissues and other structures. My guess is that the optic nerve would tear. You might see a little nub of it on the back of the eye if the eye got ripped out, but you wouldn't see some big, long dangling thing that went all the way to the brain. No, you wouldn't see that. No, but most importantly, don't rip somebody's eye out. Okay. Oh, I don't want to hear that. That's gross. Eyeball things are gross. Yuck. I know I'm, it's, it's ironic. I'm a visual neuroanatomist, but that makes me squeamy about eye things. Oh, sorry about that, about your dog. 
but now he gets to be wear a pirate patch. So I guess that is the, the, the bright side of that. Yep. All righty. So, so far so good. Pretty easy, right? Here's where things get a little bit trickier. Let's switch to a different picture. We know how to get vision to the eyeball, but if you remember way back when we were talking about uh, the muscles, we mentioned that all the muscles of the body are mixed muscles, having some combination of fast glycolytic, fast oxidative, and slow oxidative muscles, cells, with six exceptions. Those six exceptions were the muscles that move the eyeball. And I told you, you didn't have to learn them at that time, but now we have to learn the six muscles that are gonna move the eyeball. The good news is it's gonna take us about 20 seconds to do that. It's pretty much gonna take us lo me longer to draw this than it is for you to learn the muscles. All right, here, of course, is your eyeball. And there are four, six muscles that move it through space. Here, of course, over here to the right is your ear hole. Here over to the left is your nose hole. So what we have here is a straight muscle on the ear side of the eye. Now, way back when we were learning about the muscles, we learned about a straight muscle in the abdomen. We learned about a straight muscle in the leg. What do we call a straight muscle? What was that straight muscle in the belly that forms our eight pack? Oh, rectus. And this one happens to be on the ear side of the eye. So how would we identify this rectus, do you think? Well, is this the lateral side or is this the medial side? Lateral. Lateral rectus, which means that the straight muscle on the nose side would be the? Medial rectus which means the straight muscle that is above the eye would be the? Superior rectus. And the straight muscle below the eye would be the? Inferior rectus. Excellent. Notice there is also an inferior muscle to the eye that is at an angle. So instead of being a straight muscle like the abdomen, it's at an angle. So what do you think we call the angled muscle below the eye? If only we'd learn the name of an angled muscle. Uh, Sartorius. Close. Yeah. I was thinking more in the, again, girt, abdominal girdle region. What did we call the angled muscles there? The obliques, there you go. Obliques. Inferior oblique. And so then the angled muscle above the eye would be the? Superior <laughs> oblique. There you go. I told you it would take me longer to draw them than it would take you to learn them. That's why we didn't bother in the muscle region because this is so simple and easy. Now, there are three nerves that are responsible for controlling all of these muscles associated with the eye. 
Let's start with the superior oblique first. Notice I made the superior oblique look funny. The reason it looks funny is because there is a little bit of connective tissue that hangs down from the uh, orbit of the eye that changes the angle of the superior oblique muscle. Kind of the way a pulley changes the angle of a rope. And if I remember here in my humerus, I had a kind of bow tie shaped bone feature that had a pulley like appearance of it. And what did we call that bone feature of the humerus? What was the term that meant pulley? What was the bone tie, bow tie shaped bone feature at the distal end of the humerus? Trochlea, that sounds vaguely familiar. Trochlea is the fancy anatomy word for pulley. Now, as I look at my list of cranial nerves, does that ring any bells? All right, I'll ask the question this way. What is the name of cranial nerve four? Trochlear, there you go. Here in the orbit of the eye, we have a trochlea. Do you think that that is a coincidence? No, of course not. So it is indeed cranial nerve four, that trochlear nerve that controls the superior oblique muscle. Now, what happens do you think when you contract this muscle? What do you think happens? I am saying these things out loud, right? These are supposed to be the softball questions. Yeah. All it right. pulls the eye. Really. Well, so remember, if as it pulls, it's going to rotate it, but also because it's it pulling on the top, it's as it twists it, it turns it down and in. because of the change in angle. Like for instance, when you're constantly reading a book, back in ancient time, people had books and that was what they spent all their time looking at. Now you spend all your time on TikTok. And after that fourth hour of being on TikTok, don't you start to get a little bit of pain up here, like right at the top of your orbit of your eye, right up in there, doesn't you start to get a little bit of soreness? Yeah. Yeah, why? Because remember, these muscles are fast glycolytic. They produce quick, powerful contractions, but they also fatigue rapidly. So if you're constantly looking down and in, reading that book, looking at your phone, staring at your computer screen, these muscles get fatigued. That's why it's important to look up and look out the window every once in a while. So. When it comes to specific function, you can say either of those two things. You can say that it controls the superior oblique muscle, or you can say that it turns the eye down and in. But whichever of those you use for the specific function, what of course is the functional type going to be? Absolutely, motor. And that leaves us with our skull exit. If only someone in this class had already identified a nice big gaping hole in the back of the orbit of the eye that all sorts of things like random nerves and blood vessels could get through. Superior orbital fissure. 
There you go. Just that easily, we have learned everything we needed to know about cranial nerve four. I have a question. I have an answer. So you keep referring to the handout where we're supposed to have, um, I guess, all these nerves. I know we have the cranial nerves handout for where we fill out the information, but as for what nerves we're responsible for, where is that? Well, your textbooks got it. I mean, this uh, again, you're responsible for the 12 cranial nerves. So right. the, uh, the textbook or any of those things would have the, I, I didn't, you know, the point of the handout is for you're responsible for this information. So you fill it in, but you've right. got your textbook, you've got your lab manual, you have the almighty Google. There's plenty of places where you can uh, get this information. But as I, as I pointed out, one of the best places to get this stuff is your textbook. Your textbook has these amazing images that do a great job of showing this stuff. Notice right here, we see cranial nerve four, that nerve we were just talking about, going and innervating our superior oblique muscle, which we see coming off the top of the eye and going through that trochlea. So this picture is right out of your textbook. So it's a great place to see this information, as is for that matter. Right here, we see the individual muscle, and we even show it going through that superior orbital fissure. So your textbook, your lab manual are great resources for this stuff. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure I'm not missing anything. No. Nope. All right. Let's do one more easy one. What is cranial nerve six? Abducens, excellent. So cranial nerve six. What does abducens sound an awful lot like? Abduction, excellent. And of the six muscles here, which one would abduct your eyeball? Lateral rectus, exactly. Oh, which conveniently enough, I happen to put this right underneath of. So cranial nerve six controls the lateral rectus, or a B ducts the eye. Now, when do you AB duct your eye? Looking to the right. So notice if I'm staring right ahead at the screen and then I look to the right, notice I'm abducting the eye over here. If I look to the left, I'm abducting my eye over here. Can you adduct both eyes at the same time? I've seen someone do it. <laughs> yep, you can definitely do that. Can you abduct? both eyes at the same time. Anybody able to do that? Have you ever seen anybody take both eyes and have them point outwards at the same time? Yeah. Really? That's impressive. I've never seen it. Do you have a lot of instances where you need to be turning your eye outward to look at things? Not very much. This is probably, I hate to use the word least important, but probably one of the least important nerves as far as function goes. And while we can debate importance, there is no debating that this is by far the smallest cranial nerve. So of all your cranial nerves, cranial nerve six is the smallest because it has one of the least important functions. Now, we still need a way to get there. Oh, wait, functional type. Again, should be obvious. What is the functional type? Motor. And we need a skull exit to get to the eye. Hmm. 
What do you think? Haven't we? Yeah, same thing, exactly. The whole point of a fissure, well, it doesn't have to be inferior. The whole point of a fissure is it's big. Is that superior orbital fissure big enough for more than one nerve to pass through? Yes. Yeah. Again, we've got the general entrance that multiple things can pass through. So we have that superior orbital fissure and we've identified cranial nerve six. Notice we jumped over cranial nerve three. Let's sneak my nose down a little further out of the way. What is the name of cranial nerve three? Is that the medial rectus? Yeah. Oculomotor. Right. O, O, O. Cranial nerve three starts with an O, ocular motor. With a name like oculomotor, do you think it's sensory, motor, or both? Motor, absolutely. And let's get the other easy one out of the way as well. Since four's skull exit was a superior orbital fissure and six's skull exit was a superior orbital fissure, guess what the skull exit of our cranial nerve three is? Superior orbital fissure. Excellent. So then what that leaves us with is its specific function. And as the name indicates, it controls motor of the eye. It controls the remaining oops, four muscles. So that means superior rectus, inferior rectus, medial rectus and inferior oblique. But it also controls smooth muscle inside the eye. Inside the eye, we have your iris, which is smooth muscle that controls how much light comes in. And you have the muscles that change the shape of your lens that allow you to focus the eye. So you can focus at your book or you can focus at the distance. There are muscles that change the shape of your lens to be able to do that. So there is smooth muscle inside of the eye and that is also controlled by cranial nerve three. So basically any muscle here in the orbit of the eye, inside the eye or outside the eye, with the exception of the lateral rectus and the superior oblique. These are not controlled by ocular motor, but ocular motor basically controls everything else. All right, questions on this? All right, then all we're left with then is finding them. Notice here, we've got this great picture. Again, notice I love this picture from your textbook. It does such a great job of showing this stuff. Really, really excellent. Again, cranial nerve six, the abducens, we come coming to the lateral rectus, which has been cut so we can see everything else. Uh, here we see cranial nerve four, so that it's going up to the superior rectus, going through the trochlea. And then as we mentioned, ocular motor, cranial nerve three goes to the inferior rectus, inferior oblique, uh, superior 
uh, rectus uh, comes to the backside to the medial rectus. Oh, you see that going there. And notice, thanks to this ganglion, it innervates the smooth muscle in the eye. Your book puts them all together here, but it also separates them nicely, showing them individually. But here's where things get a little bit tricky, finding them. So here is our brainstem. Notice one of the important landmarks you're going to use for identifying things, uh, for identifying your cranial nerves, is your pons. Notice above the pons, there are two nerves, one medial and one lateral. The medial one is cranial nerve three. The lateral one is cranial nerve four. But here's the trick with cranial nerve four. Cranial nerve four looks lateral, but it's actually not. It's actually posterior. Notice here, if we look at the backside of the brainstem, here's our capora quadrumina, and just underneath it is that cranial nerve that comes off the backside. So if we go back to this real quickly, notice how we said that Cranial nerve six is our smallest. That was something special about it. Well, cranial nerve four is the only posterior nerve. It's the only nerve that is on the posterior side of the brainstem. And that is definitely something special about it. And notice they weren't trying to be tricky about this. If we go back to the pictures, notice here, we see that they actually drew cranial nerve four coming off of the back. And on the individual picture, here we actually see the superior and the inferior colliculi, and then coming off the posterior side, going through the superior orbital fissure is our trochlear nerve, cranial nerve four. Notice one other thing, as I mentioned, trochlear nerve six is that sad, lonely, smallest of the cranial nerves. Here, three and four hang out above the pons and poor lonely six is down here below the pons. Sure, seven and eight are down below the pons as well, but notice seven and eight are BFFs hanging out all by themselves. And poor lonely six is just here in the middle all by its lonesome, our smallest and dare I say saddest cranial nerves. And again, if we go back to the pictures, here we see six coming off the bottom, below the pons, whereas three, is on the midline above the pond. So three midline above the ponds, six midline below the ponds, and four, the posterior side of the brainstem. Excellent. Questions on any of those? All right. Here is the good news. The good news is, and let's go back to this picture. Uh, I won't bother writing three, four, and six here because we've kind of done that already. We only have one left to get to the halfway point, five. However, what's the name of five? Trigeminal. And what does tri mean? T-R-I. Three. Three. Trigeminal is our largest cranial nerve. And it actually has three distinct branches. 
And are we going to need to know those three branches? Yeah. I'm asking the question. So what's the obvious answer? Yes. Absolutely. Those three branches, it's the largest. It's the only one that comes off of the ponds. But basically, it has these three branches that kind of go just like this on your face. And these three branches are the ophthalmic. Oops. the maxillary and the mandibular. And we are going to need to know the functional types of all of them, the specific functions of all of them, and the skull exits for all of them, because they're all going to be different. Now, when we just talk about the trigeminal nerve, being the largest and with three distinctive branches, what do you think the overall functional type is going to be? Mixed, exactly. Or again, if you want to stick with our mnemonic, we can go with both. But let's look at the three branches. The first is ophthalmic. What does that sound an awful lot like? Um, okay, or, or uh, ophthalmology, or if you were to go to an op, why would you go to an ophthalmologist? Because you have problems with what? Vision. Yes, well, something with your eye, absolutely. So ophthalmic has to do with the eye. Now, it can't be vision, because we've already done vision, and we've just done every single possible movement associated with the orbit of the eye. So do you think that this is gonna be, have any kind of possible motor function? No, this is gonna be sensory in its functional type. And basically what it provides us, again, your optic nerve perceives light, but can you tell if I poke you in the eye? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. This basically provides tactile sensation touch for the eye, for the scalp, and for some of the nasal cavity. And obviously forehead as well, or in my case, five head. And if it needed to get to the orbit of the eye, might there be a real convenient way for it to do that? The superior orbital fissure? Yeah, if there's room for three nerves, is there room for a fourth? Yes. And in fact, there are indeed four nerves that pass through the superior orbital fissure. Three, four, one of the branches of five, and six. All of those go through the superior orbital fissure. Now, it gets easier from here. Maxillary branch. Guess where the maxillary branch goes? Where is your maxillary bone? There you go. Maxilla, where is that? In common terms, how would you def define the maxillary bones? Mm -hmm. Yeah, upper jaw. Excellent. Move your upper jaw. Anyone able to move their upper jaw? Yeah, no. So only has a sensory function. And again, it is going to provide tactile sensation from your upper jaw. So this is from the palate, uh, the teeth, the upper lips, right? cheeks, 
that type of sensory information. And guess where the mandibular goes? Mandible, which is the lower jaw. There you go. And what's different about your lower jaw than any other bone in your body? I mean, in your skull? It moves. It moves. So notice again, do we need to feel from our lower jaw? Absolutely. But the big difference is that we also can move our lower jaw. So this is where we get the motor which makes the whole nerve a mixed nerve because of this one motor on this one branch. But again, tactile sensation uh, from the lower jaw, again, the teeth, uh, the lower lip, um, chin, and motor. Movement of the mandible, like controlling the masseter, like controlling the temporalis. Those muscles that move our jaw through space. Again, your book's got some great, great images that do an excellent job of showing this. Here, we see these three branches. Notice Our trigeminal, the largest nerve, comes off of the pons. It's the only one on the pons. And then there's this big, huge ganglion, allowing for the three branches, ophthalmic, maxillary, and mandibular. Ophthalmic, basically, like we said, gives us tactile sensation of the eye, the scalp, the forehead, and the nose. Maxillary, teeth, upper lip, palate, mandibular, some tactile from the tongue, teeth, lips, jaw. In fact, your book's got this great picture. Uh, this one, there you go. That shows the different regions that you get the sensory information from for the trigeminal and Notice again, that mandibular branch also controls muscles that move the jaw in space, giving it that movement, that motor function. So notice if we come back here, the only thing we're missing are the uh, skull exits for the maxillary and mandibular. Now notice these branches need to be close together. So we know the first branch, the ophthalmic branch, is gonna go out that superior orbital fissure. Might there be a second opening that points right towards the maxilla, a nice round opening that might be useful for that maxillary branch? foramen rotundum, excellent. And right after that, is there a nice big oval opening that points downward right towards the maxilla? I mean, right towards the mandible? Foramen ovale, excellent. And notice if we cheat and go back a picture, two pictures, they actually show us that. Here we see the maxillary branch going through the foramen ovale, the man, uh, max, pardon, mandibular branch going through the foramen ovale, maxillary branch going through the foramen rotundum, and the ophthalmic branch going through the superior orbital fissure. So the only thing we need to add to our list here is that the maxillary branch goes through which foramen? Foramen rotundum. And that means the mandibular goes through the foramen. Ovale. Oh. 
And there you go. So for a specific branch, um, we would say, like, for example, the maxillary branch of the um, fifth trigeminal nerve. Yep, absolutely. Like so, possible. for instance, okay. so notice here on this image here, we just see the trigeminal nerve, right? Now, could I ask you to identify the three branches that comes off of it? Would that be a good lab exam question? Yeah, absolutely. However, I could also use a picture, you know, similar to, uh, what's a good one? I guess it would have to be this one, something like this. Could I point to a specific branch and ask you to identify that specific branch, say what its skull exit is, say what its functional type is, say what its specific function is. Yeah, I could do that for all three of these branches individually and ask those questions as well. All right. Questions on that? All right. We've made it to the top of the mountain. We've done our first six. Now we need to do our last six. Let's take a quick break, just a quick stretch, quick biology break. Let's come back at 1150 because I want to make sure we have enough time to finish this. So again, just a quick chance to get up, get a stretch, uh, cry, whatever it is that you need to do. Uh, and we will start back in seven minutes. So let's just take a really quick break and then uh, we will finish off the rest of the cranial nerves. As I mentioned, we have reached our halfway point, made it up the top of the mountain with the first six. Now we just have to work our way down. And some of these luckily will be easier than others. Let's start uh, easy. What is cranial nerve seven? Facial, excellent. Guess what the facial nerve does? Goes to the face. Yeah, exactly. It controls the facial muscles. As we've talked about before, you have the ability to be incredibly expressive with subtle facial expressions. Just by looking at someone's face, if you know that person well, you can tell when they're angry, when they're sad, when they're confused, when they're happy, when they're sad, when they're aroused. We can tell all of these emotions just from their facial expressions. And that's what cranial nerve seven does. It provides that facial awareness, that motor movement of the face. Now, what is the functional type of cranial nerve seven? mixed. So obviously the movement of the face is the motor component of this, but there must be some type of sensory. And it turns out the sensory is basically our sense of taste from the anterior two thirds of the tongue. Oops, it's not anywhere near how you spell tongue. There you go, that's it. On our tongue, we have those taste sensations. What are the taste sensations? How many? Do we have? All right. There's five. Excellent. What are they? Give me one of them. There's bitter and sweet. Excellent. Hold on. So I got bitter, uh, sweet. I see someone wrote sour. Two Wait, more. Salty. Salty. And we'll talk about spicy in just a minute. There it is. Umami. 
Umami is savory. Uh, it's called umami because it was Japanese uh, uh, neuroscientists who first identified and described it. Uh, but it is that savory sensation you get from like the juices of red meat or uh, uh, from a portobello mushroom, that type of savory sensation. So those are our five taste sensations. These are chemical receptors where a chemical binds to our taste bud and provides us with this sense of taste. And that's actually where spicy comes in, right? If you think about it, billions of dollars are spent every year by uh, soda companies trying to find the perfect diet soda. Something that has, that gives the taste of sweetness without actually having sugar in it. Right? They're trying to find the right key that fits in that hole, turns that lock, and gives you that sense of sweetness. That's what they're trying to do with that diet soda. Well, that's kind of where spicy comes in. Spicy is kind of like having a custodian's key. And what does a custodian's key do? It opens, it opens all the doors. And that's what capsaicin, capsaicin is one of the primary chemicals uh, that is associated with heat. And what capsaicin does is actually stimulate all of the taste receptors at the same time, giving us this huge swell of signal coming to our brain. And that confusing signal is perceived as pain. Spicy also stimulates temperature receptors from cranial nerve five, giving us that perception that the inside of the mouth is hot, right? We can often get sweaty as a result of that, red in the face as we're trying to radiate off that heat because we're being tricked into thinking that the inside of our mouth is hot and on fire. And it can also stimulate those tactile receptors uh, to give us that sense of pain. So spicy isn't necessarily its own taste reception. It's really this wave of information uh, that can be very confusing and therefore very painful to our brain. And so those, so describing... okay. sorry, go ahead. When we're describing the functions, you want us to list the five um, taste sensations too? No, just saying taste from the anterior two thirds of the tongue would be fine. However, as a different question, could I ask you to identify, you know, three of right. the five taste sensations or something like that? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Remember, th there's nothing wrong with giving it. More information is always better than less. All right. Excellent. Now, we have one other major issue for cranial nerve seven. We know its functional type. We know its specific function. We know its name and number. We need to know its skull exit. Notice its skull exit is this small opening right here between this long pointy bone feature. And what is this long pointy bone feature again? Anyone remember? Styloid process. And the large rough bumpy one behind the ear, what was that one again? The mastoid um, process. Mastoid process. And so the hole in between the styloid process and the mastoid process would be what? The stylomastoid. Foramen. Foramen. Stylomastoid foramen, absolutely. If you remember way back when we were talking about the bones, we saw how small that opening was. And remember how we talked about the mastoid process has a sinus inside. And if this sinus becomes inflamed, it can squeeze this opening, restricting that nerve. And suddenly half of your face becomes paralyzed. What did we call that condition? Anyone remember? Cerebral palsy. Yeah, or, or yeah, absolutely. And then, of course, good old Bob Bell was the first one described it. So it's also known as Bell's palsy. Right. So that Bell's palsy is that paralysis of one side of the face, typically from a restriction of this facial nerve. And as I mentioned, there have actually been two documented cases where the inflammation of the mastoid sinus occurred from someone driving in a car with the window open. 
the air was blowing past their ear, irritated their mastoid sinus, they got a mastoid infection, and that squeezed the nerve, and half their face was paralyzed because they didn't want to use the air conditioner. Ever since you told us that, I drive with my windows up. Well, you can also you can also wear earmuffs while you drive if you want to have your window open, and then that way you'll be safe. I think two I think two examples since the beginning of the invention of cars probably you're pretty safe, but uh, but yeah that it, it it there are two documented cases, absolutely, excellent. Here again we see some more of the function. Notice it also provides some uh, autonomic nervous system function that we'll talk about when we get to there, like for instance, controlling uh, our tear production and saliva production, but we'll worry about that when we get to the autonomic nervous system. All right, questions on seven. Oh, and of course, again, notice, could I show you a picture of a skull like this and have a nice big fat arrow pointing towards that and ask you to identify the nerve that passes through this bone feature? Yes. Absolutely. And of course, what bone feature am I pointing at right now? The facial. Well, okay, that's the nerve that goes through that. But what's the bone feature I'm pointing at? Oh, the styloid mastoid foramen. There you go, styloid mastoid foramen. Perfect. Excellent. All righty. Eight is another one of those alphabet soup terms that you always have to spell, but the good news is it tells you everything about it. In ancient times, and by ancient times when I was in graduate school, cranial nerve eight, and in fact, the mnemonic that I use for still to this day for the cranial nerve actually uses an A. For cranial nerve eight because it used to be known as the auditory nerve. The problem is it does more than that. And so because of that, about 15, 20 years ago, they changed the name. Yes, they made it harder to spell, vestibular cochlear, but the good news is it tells you exactly what to does. Here, inside your temporal bone, in your inner ear, there are two very fancy sensory structures. One is this big snail-like structure known as the cochlea. And the cochlea provides you with your sense of hearing. which is why it used to be called the auditory nerve. However, notice there is a second, oh, no, leave that blue. There is a second sensory structure in here. This second sensory structure is known as the vestibule. And so it is the vestibulocochlear nerve. Of course, then the question is, what does the vestibule do? And it turns out the vestibule is your equilibrium and your balance. If I were to put you in my office chair here and spin you around 16 times and then have you try to run downstairs to get a cup of coffee, would that be something easy for you to do? No, not really. No, because I would have messed up your equilibrium and balance. And that's what's happening here in this vestibule. This vestibule has fluid in it. And as that fluid moves, you get your sense of balance. You get your sense of equilibrium so that you know what up is, right? When you're in an elevator, you can tell whether it's going up or down, even if the elevator doesn't have any windows, because you can feel that acceleration up and down. If you're in the car with your eyes closed and the car starts, yes, you get pushed back into the chair, but you can still feel the acceleration as it is starting. And that is because of this second specialized structure here inside the temporal bone.
which is where we have that inner ear. Now, based on those two things that I just described, what is clearly the functional type of cranial nerve eight? Sensory, excellent. And its specific function, as we know, is going to be hearing and balance or equilibrium. However, there is one tricky thing. As I mentioned, this is all taking place inside of our temporal bone. So technically, does this nerve actually leave the skull? Does it exit the skull? No. No, no it doesn't. But it does leave the cranial cavity. And since it does leave the cranial cavity to enter into the temporal bone, we can give it skull exit as that passageway it uses to get into the temporal bone. And as you can see that, that is the internal acoustic meatus. So for skull exit, we will use internal acoustic, or remember, you could also use the term auditory, if you remember when, way back when we were talking about this meatus, or you could also use the word canal. So since it says internal acoustic meatus up there, I'll write it here, internal auditory canal. Both of those are acceptable ways of describing that opening. And so it's a teeny bit of a cheat, but it does have to leave the cranial cavity. So it is a way that it is exiting the skull in a way, in a sense. Even though it doesn't never actually fully leave the skull, at least enters the skull. And that would be the auditory, internal auditory meatus. All right. Questions on that? All right. So again, I think the trickiest part of that is its name. And notice, as we mentioned, six, seven, and eight are all located here under the ponds. But remember, as we talked about, seven and eight are BFFs sitting right next to each other. Here's seven and eight. They actually enter the skull together. Notice seven actually enters the skull in the internal acoustic meatus, but then it exits, as we know, out the stylomastoid foramen. And we don't care how it enters. We just care how it exits. But they're BFFs. They hang out together. And like we said, poor lonely six hanging out here by itself. I remind you of that because as we move to, oops, as we move to 9, 10, and 11, they all are on the lateral aspect of the medulla. Your textbook does a very nice job of emphasizing them as three separate nerves. However, if we go back to this picture, of the model in the classroom, notice as you look at this, this entire structure, notice there's a little bit of a notch there, a little bit of a notch there. This represents those three nerves. Right? There's a notch here and there's a notch here. Notice we see the notches even more prominently on this side. And these notches are what separate nine, 10, and 11. There are three separate nerves, but all of their axons come together and all of them have the exact same exit. So some illustrators, some model makers, put them all together to emphasize the symmetry in their pathways, whereas some illustrators emphasize the fact that they are indeed three different nerves and will separate them. And are you gonna be confused by that either way they show it to you? This is where you with a great confidence say, no, we will certainly understand it and not be confused. But 
The good news is, being that their axons travel together, all three of them, 9, 10, and 11, are all going to have the same skull exits. So regardless of anything else, 9, 10, and 11, all have the same skull exit. And what do you think that skull exit might be? Let's cheat. Look at the picture. Where down here might there be a nice big, dare I say, skull feature that three cranial nerves could pass through? There you go. Mitch has got it, the jugular foramen. So for cranial nerves 9, 10, and 11, all three of them, their skull exits are all the same. The jugular, oops, for Amy. I'm not getting better at spelling while I talk. You'd think after two years of this, I'd get better at typing and talking at the same time, but apparently not. All right. Excellent. So now we've got the skull exits out of the way. Let's do the uh, trickier part. Cranial nerve nine. What is the name of cranial nerve nine? The glossopharyngeal. Glosso refers to what? Anyone know? Tongue. Glosso refers to tongue. Pharyngeal refers to pharynx throat. And so that's kind of, as you see on the illustration, what it innervates, the kind of tongue and throat region. What is its functional type, sensory, motor, or both? Both. Both, excellent. Meaning that it is mixed. And that helps us a lot because then when we talk about specific functions, we know there has to be at least some sensory and some motor. So let's start with the motor first. For the motor, basically it plays a role in moving pharyngeal muscles, playing a role in swallowing and speech. Notice it also plays a role in producing saliva. Saliva production affecting one of our salivary glands. For our, oops, I misspelled sensory. For our sensory function, I'm going to put taste in quotes. The reason for this is what it really provides us with is chemical perception. Notice it is connecting to the back of the tongue. Also to the oral cavity and even your esophagus. Now, let's think about this. When you are taking that first bite of an ice cream cone, do you shove it all the way to the back of your throat? So back in your esophagus, you can taste what flavor it is? No. no. No, of course not, right? You don't have taste the way that we talk, think of sweetness and bitterness and saltiness and things like that. However, if you're drinking something very acidic, can you feel that on the roof of your mouth and the back of your throat and even as you're swallowing it? Yes. Yeah, so it's giving us some general chemical perception in those parts, acidity, uh, certain substrates. So a, a general sense of sweetness or spicy would be another place where we could feel this and things along those lines. So it's not the same kind of thing where we can taste salty or we can taste bitter or things like that, but we're getting some general chemical reception from that. And notice also from the blood as well. 
while you're not consciously aware of how much calcium is in your blood or what your pH is in your blood or how much oxygen is in your blood, are there things like that that you need to know? Yes. Yeah. And so notice here in our blood vessels is a structure known as the carotid bodies. Carotid bodies basically give us information about chemical information about the condition of the blood. Again, it's not like taste. I can't be like, oh, my blood's a little low on calcium right now, right? It doesn't quite work that way. But am I getting how much calcium is there? Is it going to parts of my brain to tell me how much calcium is there so I know if I need to modify and change it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So again, it's all about chemical perception. That's why I put taste in quotes for this. And finally, what's its skull exit? The jugular foramen. Exactly. There it is. Bingo. All right. What's cranial nerve 10? Vegas, baby. Which, of course, as we know, means to lose a lot of money. Right? <laughs> or to steal the Raiders. Is that what Vegas means? No. Vegas actually comes from the root of the same word as vagabond, wanderer. And when you look at the illustration to the right, you can see why that is. While the trigeminal may be the largest cranial nerve, there is absolutely positively no doubt that your vagus nerve is the longest cranial nerve. Notice it pretty much innervates almost every organ of the abdominal of the ventral body cavity. Heart and lungs and the thoracic cavity, stomach, liver, spleen, kidneys, small intestine, large intestine in the abdominal pelvic cavity. Even some of the muscles of our throat. And if it's going to wander this much, what do you think its functional type is? You think it's going to just carry information in one direction? No, it's both. Yeah, it's both. Right? It's a mixed nerve. Excellent. So for this part of the exam, all you have to say is that it receives information from and sends motor control to the organs of the ventral cavity. Now, what I will tell you right now is that this, this nerve, the vagus nerve, is responsible for about 90% of our parasympathetic output. So when we get to the autonomic nervous system, we'll be talking about what this vagus nerve does in a lot more depth. But just for as a cranial nerve, just a general explanation of what it does is fine for now. When we get to the autonomic, you'll learn everything you wanted to know and more about this vagus nerve. And of course, how does it get there? About a jugular foreman. There you go. And there it is again. And that leaves us with cranial nerve 11. Cranial nerve 11, uh, again, the mnemonic I've given you uses the letter A for cranial nerve 11. However, you may also see some mnemonics that have S because it is also sometimes referred to as the spinal accessory. And unlike auditory, which cannot be used, spinal accessory and accessory both are acceptable. In fact, 
spinal accessory is more words, but it helps me to remember what's unique about this one, right? We had one that came off the back. We had one that comes, uh, what the biggest, we've had the smallest, the longest. What's unique about cranial nerve 11 is as you can see from the illustration, actually many of the axons that form it start outside the skull. They start on the spinal cord which is why it's called the spinal accessory. Notice these nerves have to come back up and into the cranial cavity to become a cranial nerve. And what's the nice big opening that they use to get into the cranial cavity? Foramen magnum. Foramen magnum, excellent. However, Mitch, once we get inside, what mm -hmm. does that nerve, once it bundles into a single nerve, what is the skull exit coming out? Jugular foramen. Jugular foramen. So the jugular foramen is still the skull exit. But what's unique about this one is this one actually has to enter the skull before it can exit the skull. So that's a unique characteristic of this one. What's its functional type? Motor. Motor. Right. It's basically located here in the cervical area. And its job is basically to control that part of the neck. Hold your head upright. Look at some of the muscles here it innervates. Our friend, the sternocleidomastoid, our friend, the trapezius all of these muscles that help to stabilize and hold up our head. So we're not like bobbleheads all the time. This is our anti-bobblehead muscle, I mean nerve. Controlling <laughs> these muscles to stabilize our head and hold it in place. All right, questions on that? Excellent. And that leaves us only one. Hypoglossal. Luckily, we've already learned what glossal refers to. What does glossal refer to? The tongue. The tongue. So cranial nerve 12, as the name indicates, comes up underneath the tongue. Now, we've done taste, we've done tactile sensation, we've done pain, we've done all those things. So is there any sensory left in the tongue? No. No, and in fact, what is the functional type of the hypoglossal nerve? There you go, excellent, Sarah. Motor is absolutely correct. And if we wanna be fancy, We can say it controls the intrinsic and extrinsic muscles of the tongue. Now, let's cheat a little bit and figure out what the heck that means. So I'm going to wipe that out for a second so that I can draw my incredibly realistic picture of a tongue. An intrinsic muscle of the tongue is a muscle that is completely contained within the tongue. So the muscle is entirely, the muscle fascicle, the muscle fibers are completely inside the tongue. So with an intrinsic muscle, what would that intrinsic muscle do? Well, if you have a muscle that is completely contained within your arm, what does it do? Moves your arm. Yeah, it changes the shape of your arm. So if you have a muscle that is completely contained within the tongue, guess what it does? It moves your tongue. Yeah, well, it changes the shape of the tongue. Right? How many of you can roll your tongue or put waves in your tongue? Make it flat, make it round. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that is the intrinsic muscles that changes the shape of the tongue and allows you to do that. 
in extrinsic muscle would be a muscle that starts in the tongue, but anchors to some structure outside. And as we know, most of these extrinsic muscles connect to the hyoid bone, which we know is that movable base of the tongue. And so those extrinsic muscles that leave the tongue, true, change the shape as in stick it out and bring it back, but can't they also move it up and move it down and left and right and all around? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So intrinsic muscles change the shape of our tongue and extrinsic muscles move the tongue in space. <clears throat> and the hypoglossal nerve controls both. So our hypoglossal nerve controls both the intrinsic and extrinsic muscles. Now, notice the way I've drawn this. If I were to take a cross section of the tongue, just by looking at a bundle of axon, I mean, a bundle of muscles, would you be able to tell which ones are intrinsic and which ones are extrinsic? No, no of course not. So I'm not gonna point at a cross section of the tongue or even a picture like this of the tongue and have you identify an intrinsic or extrinsic muscle. That's not the point of this. Do you need to know what an intrinsic muscle does and what an extrinsic muscle does? Yes, but I'm not gonna point at it and say, what does this muscle do? Or is this an intrinsic or extrinsic muscle? That's not what I'm gonna ask. But you should know what they are and what they do. And lastly, identifying it. Notice 9, 10, and 11, as we talked about our lateral on the medulla, whereas 12 is more medial. In fact, notice there is this big bulge between 9, 10, and 11 and cranial nerve 12. Any idea what that big bulge might be? Uh, it's like olive. The olive, exactly. And in fact, if we look at the uh, model, the model, they actually make the olive pink. So that olive is really, really obvious. I've of course now covered it up so you can't see the pink, but you can see a little bit of a pink there. Clearly showing us that this is cranial nerve 12 whereas this is nine, this is 10. And notice coming up from the spinal cord, this is 11. So those are nine, 10, 11, and 12. Nine, 10, 11. So the very last thing we need is a skull exit, a nice opening that our hypoglossal nerve could pass through, hypoglossal canal. If you remember, when we looked at the skull, this picture doesn't do a good job of showing it, but remember underneath, oh, that's horrible. superior to the occipital condyle is that opening that travels through. So we don't really see it in this view. Uh, even your, your uh, lab manual doesn't do a great job of showing it. This is the view from the lab manual. So it kind of infers where it is coming through above that condyle and we can see it that way. All right, and look at that with seven minutes to spare, we have finished off all of our cranial nerves. Excellent. Questions on any of that? All right, I appreciate you giving me your time, putting the effort into today. Uh, like I said, I know, uh, like me, I'm sure there's food prep you need to be doing for tomorrow. I appreciate mm -hmm. you guys taking the time. I have a safe and happy holiday and I will see you on Monday. All right. And Thank again, you. I want Thank you paying you. attention to me, not cyber shopping on Cyber Monday. We're, pay attention in class. All right. <laughs> There'll be plenty of Amazon specials after lecture.
Thank you. Right. <laughs> Thank you. See you guys on Monday. Bye. Bye.